Test. One, two. Test. I would like to call to order the regular board meeting of Tuesday, November 29th, 2022. As is our custom, we begin our board meeting with the singing of our national anthem. We are very honored today to have a pre-recorded video of students from David Thompson School singing O Canada. I'd ask everyone to please stand and follow the lead of the students. We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories and oral practices of the Blackfoot Nations, which include the Siksika, the Pikani, and the Guyana. We also acknowledge the Sutena and Stony Nakota First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their home in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our staff and public in attendance at this meeting including uh, one of our colleagues who will be on camera today. Jenna Gorkoff from the Jack James High School and Helen Colborn from Louise Dean High School. Our first item of business is to approve the agenda for today's meeting. Ms. Minor, do you have any changes that need to be noted? Madam Chair, there are no agenda changes to be noted for today's meeting. Could I have a motion that the agenda be approved as submitted? Thank you, Trustee Dennis. Those in favor of the motion? Uh, Trustee Downey? In favor. Thank you. That is carried unanimously. Today we have three requests for public comment. I'd like to ask our speakers to focus on the matters before the board today and refrain from speaking on the personal character or performance of any individuals, departments, or school in accordance with our board meeting procedures. Rod Tomlinson, would you please come forward to the podium? 
State your name and any organization you represent. You'll be given three minutes to address the board. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rod Tomlinson. Um, on the matter of the move of the Louise Dean Center. Um, I'm drawn to this matter by my professional background, which is uh, as a professor of social work practice at the University of Calgary. Uh, I taught there uh, and I did research and I did practice in the area of family, marriage, uh, and uh, adolescence. Um, and for the past year, I have been studying the developmental trauma research following my attendance at a week-long conference on the matter. Um, I attended the first uh, of November meeting, um, and I'm aware that Kensington may well need to close. Um, I just absolutely don't agree with the school sharing proposal, certainly not uh, a Jack James bubble proposal. Um, it is my belief and my uh, learning that the proposal failed to take into account the vast amount of research literature on, adoles uh, uh, on adolescent brain science that, uh, that we've come across in the past several decades, and more recently on the tremendous research on developmental trauma. That research, in my opinion, agrees with the students, staff, both present and, and, and former students and staff who object to the school sharing model in any shape or form. The research demonstrates is the tremendous importance of the right relationship context that this program needs for its students. Trauma victims need to heal in a relationship context with other trauma victims. That has been shown in so many ways and probably the best well-known example is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. These two organizations have made vast improvements in the lives of millions of people simply by making sure that it is done in the context of the people who are hurting. Um, I don't, in three minutes, <laughs> have much more to say, but I have completed a three-page brief on the matter uh, of the research available that supports the idea that uh, school sharing is not a good idea for the Louise Dean program. I've given a copy to the corporate secretary, and um, uh, I would really request that you go to your kindred colleagues, the Catholic family, uh, Catholic family service used to be called kindred, it's now called kindred, uh, and, and ask them to validate. They are your colleagues, uh, colleagues and advisors on the matter of, of mental health, and um, uh, ask them to validate these notes that I've made and then take them seriously. Uh, Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak this morning. I hope I've made the three minutes. Thank you so much, Rod. I will now call on Stephanie Fenley. Please come forward to the podium, state your name and organization you represent. You'll be given three minutes to address the board. My name is Stephanie. I'm here with the Wilberforce Project. I'm here. I'd like to start by telling you a story of the first time I was in labor and delivery. And it wasn't my pregnancy, and I'm not a nurse or a doctor. In fact, I was practically a stranger. It was only the second time I'd met this young mom. The first time was when I went to her home to hear her story and learned that she was an international student. Her boyfriend dumped her when she got pregnant, and her parents, who were over 4,000 miles away, told her to get rid of her baby and finish her education. And this young woman wanted her, her child. 
So we talked about the resources she needed and what she had available to her. We got her connected as best we could with those supports. And I told her to call me when she was in labor, because her plan had been to take the bus. So the second time I met her was indeed when she was in labor. I went back to her home and we walked and we breathed and eventually went to the hospital. And a few hours later, we placed her son on her chest. And she was so proud. But the hardships weren't over then. The next semester, she registered back into class. She worked a night shift at a senior home while her son slept at her friend's house. During the day, she studied and parented <laughs> and slept. Now she's a nurse and a mom of a 10-year-old. Thank you. Why do I tell you this story? One, because it taught me firsthand just how unique the needs are of young moms, young student moms, and the importance of a stranger. And I believe that we are the strangers to the next students who need the Lewis Dean School. And I think these young girls have a hardship already in front of them, and you have an opportunity to make that easier for them by providing them safe, unique, customized care. A school that I wish was replicated and, and, um, and replicated across the province. So I put before you, speaking to many women, <laughs> as a woman and as a mom now myself, that we have an opportunity, you have an opportunity right now to support these young women and give them a unique opportunity in their most precious time, most vulnerable state emotionally and physically, to keep them in a school that's dedicated to their unique situation, instead of putting them at risk in a, in a school that we know has had increased threat recently. So, as this mother... Stephanie, your time is now up. Thank, thank you. you so much for sharing. Next on our agenda is item 8.1, 2021-2022, year-end financial results and audited financial statements. Trustee Dennis is chair of the Board of Trustees Audit and Risk Committee. Would you please introduce this report? Sure, happy to do so. Um, so as uh, Chair Hack said, I have the pleasure of serving the Board of Trustees as the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. And um, on November the 16th, the Audit and Risk Committee, uh, which includes two trustees, um, external members, and also uh, supported by our auditors and the uh, members of administration, um, we reviewed the financial results and the audited financial statements of the Calgary Board of Education. The Audit Risk Committee at that time recommended that the um, uh, statements could go before the board um, to be presented today for discussion. And um, with the Board of Trustees, where we were able to um, ask a number of questions of our auditors um, as part of our oversight role to ensure um, that uh, we were managing any risks and also accurate and demonstrated um, a, a prudent approach to our uh, Chief Superintendent, Chris Lucy, for any other comments before we begin. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee uh, Dennis, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Trustees. Um, we are pleased uh, to present the audited financial statements for the Calgary 2022. Um, as the board deliberates on these financial statements before you today, um, you will see that the CBE acted prudently and consistently in alignment with our mission, values, our board's priorities, and the education plan. Uh, the CBE is committed to success for all students. Programs and services are aligned to support student achievement and well-being within the resources allocated to the CBE 
through our broader education. These financial statements demonstrate that commitment. With our commitment to delivering the highest quality of public education, we continually strive to balance a number of important and sometimes competing challenges. These include, firstly, the realities of the public health situation, secondly, provincial public education expectations and funding, and thirdly, inflationary and operational pressures. We continue to make strategic investments to ensure strong outcomes for our students and the district. Before I pass it on to our Chief Financial Officer, I would like to offer my thanks to all staff for their commitment to each student every day, no exceptions, and ensuring that every student at the CBE can succeed personally and academically, irrespective of their personal circumstances. As well, uh, the pers uh, staff, I want to thank staff for the perseverance in the face of uncertainty, as well as the professionalism in addressing student need in very challenging uh, environments. At this time, Madam Chair, I'd like to invite uh, Superintendent Grundy to provide additional remarks and we'll certainly be happy to answer uh, your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chief Usi. Trustees, before I get into my introductory comments, I need to update you on some late breaking changes to some of the information in the report before you. I'm understanding that each of you has a uh, hard copy of this report. So I'll work through the five pages that have adjustments on them at a deliberate pace so that you can uh, flip to the appropriate page and make the necessary changes. So the first page that has a change on it is 8-14 of your package. As you flip to that, it should be your consolidated statement of cash flows. So on 8-14, the first change is up under operating transactions at the top of the page. Uh, you will see disposal of supported tangible capital assets. Currently, it's showing nothing. It should read 699. The next change on that page is under capital transactions. So about midway down, there's a line that says acquisition of tangible capital assets. It should read 63792 in brackets, 63792. I believe you have in brackets 96481. The related subtotal there for cash flows used in capital transactions should read 63741 in brackets versus your in brackets 96430. Under financing transactions further down towards the bottom, you'll see increase in spent deferred capital contributions. Uh, you have 45899, uh, it should read 45901 which means that that subtotal titled cash flows from financing transactions should read 43,363 rather than 43,361. That then changes the increase in cash and cash equivalents to 4,675 rather than the in brackets 28,019 that you have. And then the bottom line should be updated to 208 831. So that's on 8-14. On 8-20, so if you flip it a couple pages, uh, towards the right side of the page, there is a column titled Unsupported Amortization and Other Expenses. And then you'll see towards the bottom, there is the number 4590000. That should read 3 million, 3000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000. Therefore, the uh, total amortization below that should read 3 million. And the bottom line for that column should read $3,368,000 versus the 4958000 Same page, second, next column over supported capital and debt service. 
you currently have for supported debt. So if you go across that line and to that column, it currently reads 52828000. It should read 54418000. And therefore the total at the bottom of that column should read 58290000. The third page is 8-120, so way deep in the report. So page 8-120 should be statement of operations. Uh, under expenses, the top line says instructions hyphen ECS. That should read 42892000 in the budget column. So the first column. That instruction ECS line should be 42892. And the second row instruction grades 1 to 12 should read 1,033,211,000. The subtotal for that section, total expenses, remains the same. It was just a bit of an adjustment between those two numbers to align with Alberta education reporting requirements. The next page is 8 one, two, two, one. So the next page. Uh, towards the top, you will see uh, transfer of tangible capital assets uh, from two other entities should read 699000. I think you have nothing. It should read 699000. Under capital transactions, acquisition of tangible capital assets it should read $63,792,000 rather than the 62,646,000 that you have. That subtotal then should read 63,741,000 rather than the 62,595 that you have. In the financing transactions, section D, uh, increase decrease in spent deferred capital contributions, that should read $42,079,000. So 4207900. Further down in that section, to match increase in spent deferred capital contributions to financial statements, that should now read 1146000 Once again, the, the subtotal in that section remains the same and the bottom line remains the same. And finally, on page 8-130, so page 8-130, this is very similar to the um, adjustments we made previously. This is a similar schedule. If you go to the unsupported amortization and other expenses, you have on the line unsupported 4,590,000 it should read 3 million. The bottom line total then becomes 3,366 rather than 4,958. And in the supported capital and debt service column, under supported, it should read 54,418,000. Uh, and the subtotal should be updated to 58,200. $90,000. So once again, my apologies for those late breaking adjustments. CB administration and the auditors were having this conversation last night uh, as they did their final scan of the documents. Uh, but those are the final numbers for the 2022-20, uh, sorry, the 2021-22 school year. So my apologies. So with regard to my introduction, uh, Thank you, Chief Usi, and through the chair to trustees. Before you today are the audited financial statements for the Calgary Board of Education for the 2021-2022 school and fiscal year. The financial statements conclude the process set out in Operational Expectation 5, Financial Planning. That process begins with the creation of a budget that is approved by the Board of Trustees and submitted to Alberta Education by the end of May each year. The process continues with quarterly variance reports that are provided to you throughout the school year. 
Those quarterly reports highlight variances, if any, between actual and planned results to ensure openness and transparency in the CBE stewardship of the public monies provided in support of public education. That process includes the board's approval and access to CBE operating reserves when required to address new or emergent challenges and augment funding identified in the budget. Finally, the process ends with the independent and objective external audit of the financial results. The independent auditor's opinion on the CBE's financial reports is included in the material before you today. I am pleased to note that the auditors, KPMG LLP, the audit opinion is without reservation or qualification. In other words, a clean audit opinion. My thanks to the small and mighty team tasked with making that happen here within the CBE. Subject to your approval today, these financial results will be submitted to Alberta Education on or before November 30th, 2022. Trustees, the information contained in these statements provides a concise summary of the CBE's actions and activities between September 1st, 2021 and August 31st, 2022. In reviewing the report, we are asking you to cast your minds back to that school year. As you will recall, the 2021-2022 school year continued to feel the impact of the global COVID-19 pandemic. The financial statements reflect that impact in several ways, and those are detailed in the report before you. Despite the high degree of uncertainty of the past school year, the CBE ended the 2021-22 school year with a deficit of only $10.9 million. We are pleased to report that that deficit is well less than 1% of 2021 22 revenues. These financial statements also show that the CBE has appropriate levels of operating and capital reserves. Those reserves support the CBE's ability to maintain the continuity of teaching and learning in the face of uncertainty. Overall, these results demonstrate a high degree of financial discipline and sound fiscal management at the Calgary Board of Education. Trustees, we are happy to take your questions at this time. I'll ask trustees if they have any questions or comments on the report. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my first question is on a page FS15 um, under Schedule 3 Program of Operations, and in particular, Line 9, uh, which talks about fees. Now, if I remember correctly, due to the, um, uh, I guess, reduction in demand for transportation services last year due to the pandemic, that we, did we not eliminate transportation fees and then we refunded money to any uh, families who paid uh, before the end of February, if I remember that correctly. I'm just curious then about that, um, the 8,000 that's sitting in that line, just did we collect then fees after the February cutoff? Is that where that's coming from or what does that $8,000 represent? Thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Uh, the fees that you're referencing are related to um, the Z pass that students use to access uh, their their yellow school bus transportation. Uh, specifically, those are fees for the replacement of the Z pass. So the way our fee structure works is if a student uh, loses, misplaces their Z pass, the first replacement is ten dollars, uh, the second request is fifteen dollars, and the third and subsequent requests are twenty dollars. So the number that you're referencing is the revenue collected. Uh, to offset the cost of providing those replacement Z passes. Trustee Dennis with a follow-up? Probably just a follow-up comment. That's a lot of lost passes, <laughs> I guess. I, I, yeah, I mean, I maybe have another question about that later, just kind of on how, how those passes are held or issued, and maybe if there's a way to put them on their phones, because I'll bet they won't lose them if they're on their phones. But thank you for that. Trustee May. Uh, thank you for the update live, um, updating the numbers. 
Um, I just am curious, is it common for us to um, be updating on the day that we're approving and are there any material differences in the changes that uh, we need to be aware of? So through the chair, thank you for that question. No, it is um, somewhat uncommon. Having said that, the audit is not concluded until the audit is concluded. So our apologies uh, for those late breaking changes. In terms of uh, uh, material changes, the um, CBE statement of operations is unchanged and the um, statement of financial position, so both the balance sheet and the income statement are unaffected by the changes that were referenced. Uh, what did happen was some discussions around how we were recording some capital transactions within the organization. It was not new or different capital transactions. It was just changes to where the auditors felt we ought to um, display those transactions. So no, from my perspective, um, no material impact on the major components of the financial statements uh, as a result of those changes. Trustee Bukadinovich. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I have a question around the Comprehensive Service Transformation Initiative. Page 57 of 136 in this report makes reference to the CBE undertaking a comprehensive service transformation initiative. The CBE has a culture, culture of excellence, which is why I choose to send my own children to CBE schools. And this culture of excellence comes from the CBE's commitment to continual improvement. Could you please tell me more about the Comprehensive Service Transformation Initiative? Through the chair. So service transformation uh, is an evolving CBE priority. Uh, certainly it's forming part of the uh, CBE administration's deliberations currently around our uh, systemic priority. Uh, we began the work in the Finance and Technology Services Service Unit. So service transformation is acknowledging the reality that the uh, service delivery model that's been put in place to support our schools primarily, but also other service units to an extent, uh, was created in a different era uh, with different levels of funding, uh, different staffing levels, uh, different technological opportunities and, and, and tools. And so service transformation is focused on uh, taking a customer perspective. And in this case, think of our schools as the customer of services provided by service units. So financial services, human resource services, facility services, legal services, some educational services. And we wanna make sure that the way we provide those services to our customers, the schools, is efficient, effective, and economical. And to do that, we need to take a broad view, a holistic view of those processes and you know, fundamentally rethink how we provide them. So a couple of examples might be illustrative. Uh, one would be uh, previously each school would go out and source its own printer, for example. So they would go through a procurement process to obtain the number of printers they need. They would be responsible for then um, funding that they would be responsible for the operating costs of those uh, photocopiers. They would be responsible for repairs and maintenance and replacement. That takes a lot of time and energy across our system in each of our schools. So we have centralized our print management strategy so that centrally we can uh, do the procurement of the print devices. We deploy those to schools. We take care of making sure that the appropriate toner is there at when necessary. Uh, we take care of the maintenance. We take care of the life cycle costs. And schools are only left with paying a per page cost uh, based on their usage. So there's an example where we've rethought how we provide service to our schools uh, and taken an approach that's more efficient, effective, and economical. Uh, another uh, example that we're looking at is around te technology, so that the provision of technology. Right now, there's lots of opportunity for schools to go out. We started to put in place some standards and some expectations to try and um, better manage that and take that administrative burden at the school level off them having to go out and source uh, the, the necessary technology to support teaching and learning. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what service transformation is. It's uh, not something that will end uh, in this fiscal year, for example, there is a great deal of work to do and we'll just work through it on primarily a risk-based approach where we look at the processes or practices that provide the greatest benefit and then we 
tease them apart and find different and better ways to, to provide those services. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. My next question is from page FS38 regarding the master service agreement. So the statement at the bottom of that page indicates that we entered into a five-year master service agreement with Southland Transportation, um, but we are also executing on annual service agreements that include things like um, applicable rates, performance indicators, um, anticipated fees and charges. And so, I, th I think I'm mistakenly under the understanding that all of those things would be covered under a master service agreement. So can you just address what is the difference between our master service agreement and these annual agreements that we're looking at? Through the chair, certainly. So the master transportation agreement contains all of those things that don't change. They're constant throughout the five-year term. and so. What I'm talking about here are things like requirements for background checks for drivers, uh, first aid training requirements, um, requirements for uh, the entity having a GST number, or obligation of all parties to the agreement, insurance requirements. So those are the uh, sort of the, the, the constants throughout the agreement. And then the annual service agreement is created to reflect the fact that Obviously, over the course of those uh, many years of the agreement, uh, we have to be cognizant that uh, cost of living and other factors will influence rates. And so um, the annual service agreement contains items like the rates, again, based on what might be happening um, from a, uh, a consumer price index perspective might indicate also new performance measures if there's something that we identify during the year or, or it, during one year that we feel suddenly becomes important a subsequent year. It would include things like what routes are assigned to the service provider. And so again, based on what we've seen in previous years in terms of performance, they may be getting more or fewer routes uh, and those routes being adjusted. Um, and so there's where sort of the delineation and the differentiation occurs between the two. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. Through the chair, on page 54 of 136, I read that the CBE faces monumental cost pressures from inflation. The CBE is highly regarded because of our strong emphasis on character development and citizenship, because of our incredible career in technology and STEM labs, and because of the world-leading academic results of our students. As a result, we are a system with growing enrollment. Yet despite our growing enrollment and despite a growing budget at Alberta Education, the CBE has received flat funding since 2019. There is a chart on this same page that illustrates that the flat funding coupled with inflation amounts to a shortfall of over 145 million in funding. Um, if the provincial government were to increase the CBE's annual funding, operational funding by $145 million to close this inflation gap, that money could go a long way towards reducing class sizes, addressing the mental health needs and growing complexity in our classrooms, and tackling deferred maintenance before it's too late and, be, and it becomes too expensive to repair a building. So could you paint a picture to, for me? What do you mean when you say inflation-adjusted funding for students? equates to a difference of over 145 million in funding. And again, this is page 54 of 136. So through the chair, uh, I wanna be clear that we are not identifying a funding shortfall of 145 million. Rather, we're trying to illustrate the impact of inflation uh, against what our actual funding is. And so that would be the $145 million that you're referencing. And perhaps, uh, a, a little bit smaller example might be apropos. So if in, uh, let's say today, we get $9,000 per student in funding and inflation over the next five years is 2%, you would need $9,937 at the end of those five inflationary years to be equivalent to the $9,000 that you get today. So that's kind of what we're trying to demonstrate here is that inflation is a real factor for the CBE. Uh, we purchase a good deal of goods and services. And as everybody's aware these days, the rate of inflation has increased well above 
the 2% that I used in my example. So if we apply that similar logic to the entirety of the CBE, you get the $145 million uh, delta that we're showing in that, that chart. Thank you. Jesse Bulger, go ahead. Thanks, Chair Hack. In 2021-22, the CB received just over $99 million from Alberta Education for specialized learning supports. The board spent an additional $47.5 million from its budget to support these students. At the October 25th board meeting this year, we received an excellent presentation on inclusive education and specialized programming that provided us with a great appreciation for the vast range of programming that is available to the students we serve. So in relation to this, I have a couple of questions. And the first is, how is this additional $4.5 million used? And secondly, how does spending that amount of money impact community schools and students in the CBE? So through the chair, uh, the additional dollars as discussed on October 25th are used to support a wide range of programs, supports and services for students that bring complexity into their learning environment. So that's how those dollars are used across the CBE. So money comes in from the province, the CBE from the remainder of its uh, budget augments it to the tune of $47.5 million as noted. And then we deploy those into schools uh, and into some central support services to make sure that we have the necessary program services and supports for students with complexity. The second part of your question uh, asks, how does that decision or how does the spending of that extra $47.5 million impact community schools? So two ways, um, two sides of a, a coin perhaps. On the one side, it makes sure that community schools have the programs, supports and services necessary to support the students in their school uh, who bring some complexity to that school. On the other side, the CBE has a finite budget. And if we move $47.5 million from general revenue, let's say to the, the supports for students with complexity, there will be fewer dollars for those basic costs. So there's an impact on that side, um, sometimes felt in terms of you know, fewer resources available, maybe a slight increase in overall class size. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, they uh, benefit from the program service and supports that are available for students with complexity. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. I have a question on uh, page MDNA 7, and it's regarding the compliance review funding. So I'm just wondering what are some of the ways that we are managing, you know, trying to manage down that amount that we need to repay to government? And um, perhaps maybe in the answer you could explain what that compliance review um, is. So through the chair, uh, so Alberta Education is our primary funder. They have criteria in place to determine who an eligible student is within the province of Alberta. So if you are, you know, obviously born in Alberta and you reside in Alberta, you are an eligible student within the public education sphere within the province of Alberta. If you are a newcomer to Canada, uh, depending upon your residency status, you may or may not be eligible to receive a public education in the province of Alberta. So in recognition of that, uh, Alberta Education as an accountability mechanism has implemented a compliance review process. That process entails them reviewing the documentation that's on file or available, supporting the eligibility of all students to receive public education in the province of Alberta. It shouldn't come as a surprise to folks that when there's a newcomer to Canada, they come from different places um, and their access to the sort of number of documents that are necessary to support their eligibility to receive a public education can vary uh, greatly. So when we go through this process, Alberta Education reviews the documentation. Uh, they give us a list of students um, that they have questions about with regard to their eligibility. There's a bit of a back and forth with Alberta Education as we flow documents, obtain new documentation, uh, correct uh, gaps and absences in terms of the paperwork and those kind of things. And then we settle on the number of students that we have accepted into the CBE who, based on the, the documentary evidence, aren't eligible for public education. 
and those dollars are then returned to the province. Obviously, we want to minimize the amount of dollars that we give back to the province. So we work very diligently across the system to ensure we have a high level of compliance with those documentation requirements. So that entails the finance and technology services service unit, the service unit I'm responsible for, working with our welcome center, for example, to make sure that they're clear on what the nature of the documents is that we require. We also work with our schools to make sure that they're gathering, collecting and maintaining the appropriate documentation for all students in their school. Um, and we make sure to the extent possible that everything documentation wise is where it needs to be. So we do that. We also have conversations with uh, Alberta Education around um, the reasonableness of some of the documentation requests um, based on where newcomers are coming from, uh, time periods, and so it's a very evolving area. And just recently we received some communication from Alberta Education that they will be slightly relaxing some of the requirements and providing more time to allow the accumulation of necessary documents to support eligibility. So we continue to have conversations. Our goal is that every student who's in the province of Alberta uh, is eligible to receive that public education and we'll do our level best to make sure we support and encourage them to get the documentation in to support that, uh, that determination. Trustee Vukadinovich. Thank you. Through the chair, this question is around the future financial outlook for the CBE. According to page 76 of 136, with enrollment significantly higher than projections, the CBE is confident in the continued support from the government. Using the weighted moving average funding model, the 2022-23 increased enrollment ought to generate a receivable of 15 million. But after years of flat funding, I'm concerned that 15 million is not nearly enough to address growing complexity in our classrooms, our significant enrollment growth and inflation. And this is on top of the $32 million funding cut that occurred in the middle of the 2019-2020 school year, which I think many people forget about because it was overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic that year. Do you have a sense of what level of additional funding would be required to fund the specialized programs we operate for our students with special needs? Do you have a sense of what level of additional funding would be required to avoid a backlog of deferred maintenance? Do you have a sense of what level of additional operational annual funding would be required to keep our STEM labs and our CTS labs up to date? And do you have a sense of what level of additional annual operating funds would be required to lower class sizes? Uh, through the chair. So there's a number of questions there and I'll do my best to work my way through them. So as it relates to students with uh, complexity. Uh, I think we've shared previously that the CBE conservatively spends approximately $47.5 million more uh, to support students that bring complexity into the, the learning environment than we receive through the provincial specialized learning support grants. Having said that, uh, obviously the dollars that are provided to the CBE in its entirety uh, can be allocated by the school jurisdiction to best meet the needs of all students. But if you're asking for a relatively specific number, $47.5 million would get us close to even in terms of grant funding and the related expenditures for students with complexity. I would add to that, however, that we are currently seeing an increase in the number of students presenting with complexity. And we're also seeing an increase in the complexity of that complexity within the system. So that's a more difficult number to tease apart and there's certainly conversations and discussions ongoing within the CBE around what are the necessary programs, services and supports uh, to address all of the students complexity needs and how do we manage that within the funding allocation we receive from the province. You asked uh, about deferred maintenance. So de deferred maintenance has been an ongoing challenge not only in public education but I would argue across the public sector. Uh, there is a significant amount of infrastructure that is owned either directly or indirectly by the province of Alberta and maintaining all of that infrastructure to an appropriate level to meet its respective use uh, is an ongoing challenge. Uh, I believe if you talk to my colleague uh, in uh, facilities and environmental services, our, our deferred maintenance is in the $100 million range subject to how that, that's calculated. So certainly any additional resources that are sent our way uh, can be immediately deployed to help 
bring down that deferred maintenance backlog. We understand that it's a, a balancing act at the provincial level to make sure that they're sending their finite dollars in the right places, but any dollars that come our way would be gladly received and deployed to, to help manage the uh, deferred maintenance. You talked about uh, STEM and our career and technology studies labs. Uh, once again, the CBE is undertaken or is undertaking a review of those programs. Uh, you are quite right. There is a significant initial cost to set up a number of those kinds of uh, labs and facilities. So if you think about, you know, commercial kitchens for students that want to explore that spectrum to, you know, automotive uh, shops and, and bodywork shops, there's a significant investment there. As well, there's an investment to sustain and maintain those labs over time. All again, within those um, constrained uh, and limited public education dollars. So we're looking at, as an organization, how do we best manage that? I, I'm encouraged by the fact that the provincial government has opened up some public um, feedback around those programs and how to move forward and provide greater opportunity. Do I have a number for that? Uh, not at this time, but it's certainly something we're looking at and we know that there is a pressure associated with those programs. Thank you. Trustee Dennis. Thank you. Uh, back over to FS15 again. Um, line, sorry, yeah, line nine, external services. What does that, um, we've got 15,742,000 in the external services column under fees. What is that for? So through the chair, per direction from Alberta Education, the external block uh, is to contain those activities undertaken by school jurisdictions that cannot use Alberta Education funding. So a couple of examples. The CBE provides a program for international students to attend CBE schools, as those students are not eligible to receive a public education funded by Alberta Education, the CBE charges a tuition fee to those students. The tuition revenue and the related cost to provide those educational services to those international students is included within the external block. So just once again, it's not something that we're mandated to provide. Uh, but we do provide it because there are benefits in our schools to having that added diversity as well it provides a great opportunity for those international students to come and experience the, the Canadian learning environment and generally speaking it provides a positive net contribution to the bottom line of the CBE which allows those dollars to be reinvested in the public education for all students in the system. A second example would be noon hour supervision. So we are obligated under the Education Act to provide an appropriate level of supervision to students. The CBE has made the decision to not task that supervision for K to six to our educators so that we can maximize the hours that are available to educators to provide teaching and learning. So as an alternative, we have a noon hour supervision program where parents can choose to uh, have their students at school through the noon hour. They're adequately supervised, but there's a fee that's charged for that service. That fee and the related costs would run through the external block within the CBE. Thank you. I'm gonna ask a question just in relation to that, because I know um, Superintendent Grundy talked a little bit about the lunchroom supervisors. Just correct my understanding here. Um, how that money is spent, who is hired, how many is all up to the principals, if I'm understanding this. Um, so principals are given a lot of autonomy in this area as well as the RAM every year. What mechanisms, um, just in relation to risk management, do we have in place to ensure that the money that parents or guardians pay is used for quality lunch supervision and isn't used for other purposes? Do we have a reporting back, accountability, and in what way? So through the chair to the chair, um, thanks for that question. So the noon hour supervision program, as mentioned, we charge a fee for that, depending on the number of days students attend um, school. Uh, so there's some options there for, for families to select from. Um, we estimate based on historical trends, what the total cost of offering the program would be to the number of students who have enrolled in the program. And that derives what the fee is. So we collect that fee revenue 
And you're correct, through our resource allocation method or school budgets, we deploy um, dollars to schools based on the number of students who will be participating in the noon hour supervision program. And those dollars are to be used to hire the noon hour supervisors for that school to supervise those students. Uh, as schools go through their annual budgeting process, they work closely with um, some representatives from finance and technology services to make sure that the plans that principals have in place for the noon hour supervision program are appropriate within the guidelines and rules that we've established for schools around noon hour supervision programs so that they're hiring sufficient staff, that those staffs are be, staff are being dedicated to the provision of noon hour supervision. And then at the end of, uh, as we go through the year, if there are issues or challenges identified either by finance and technology staff, or perhaps we get some queries from the public or it comes up through another means, we investigate those issues with the respective school and make sure that we're applying um, the, the dollars appropriately under the program. And then as you see in our audited financial statements, we report back at a high level, total fee revenue in and related expenditures for the, for the noon hour supervision program. Thank you. Uh, Trustee May, go ahead. So my question is on page 8-87 around the financial health matrix, um, or 8-86. So the working capital per student is currently listed as favorable. I do see the amount has increased slightly from 2016-2017. Uh, can you explain this item and if there was a decision made to increase the amount based on any external or internal factors? Uh, thank you, and through the chair. So for the benefit of us, Others, working capital is a concept within the sort of the financial world. Uh, it, it is essentially the excess, hopefully, of short-term liquid assets over short-term liabilities. So working capital is an indication of the ability of the organization to meet its operating obligations, so the liabilities, over the course of the operating cycle. So ideally, what you'd want to see is short-term liquid assets to be at least equal to, if not in excess of, short-term liabilities. Uh, as uh, Trustee May has identified, the CBE has a very positive working capital uh, balance. For every $1 of short-term liability, we have approximately $1.77 of short-term liquid assets. So $1.77 of cash, for example, for each dollar of liability. And that's a fairly healthy place to be and it's reflected in our financial health matrix. With regard to the question of whether or not there was a conscious decision made to increase our working capital balance, I would say no. We do monitor our uh, cash flow closely to make sure that we always have sufficient cash to meet our operational requirements so we can pay our staff and, and, and our bills. Um, and given the way we are funded by the province, that is generally not a significant challenge because we get draws on a monthly basis, usually in advance of the dollars going out the door for payroll and those kinds of things. However, over the period that you referenced from 2016-17, the CBE um, constructed a number of new schools. Uh, those new schools incurred some costs. And through that process, we ended up um, receiving some cash back into the CBE, which has uh, increased our cash balance at the end of this fiscal year and, and the ones before it, as you can see represented. So that's the reason why we've seen such an increase in our working capital balance. It was as a result of those past transactions and events. If you do look at the um, financial health matrix around that ratio, you'll see that it was moving along at somewhere around, let's say 1 1.4, 1 1.35, 1 1.3. Uh, and then with the infusion of those cash dollars, it's moved up to 1.77. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. My next question is from MD&A 8 regarding fees. And I'm asking this question purely in the interest of, um, I guess, sustainability and risk management a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering just how often do we reevaluate uh, program specific fees, such as our instrument rental. Um, 
Now, unless things have changed uh, from when my own kids were in band, um, the rental fee was extraordinarily low, um, considering the asset that we were placing in in kids' hands in our band programs. And so, um, you know, if we're looking to replace, you know, large percussion instruments like chimes, xylophones, drum kit, timpanis. We're going to take a short recess here, please. I will reconvene the meeting here. Um, we were just in the middle of questions or comments. Financial results and audited financial statements. Go ahead. Thank you so much. That was a very exciting break. Um, fees, and so um, I'll just repeat. So my interest in asking, and um, it could pertain to, I mean, the instrument rental fee, but I guess really any um, course that we charge addis additional fees for. Um, you know, I'm using sort of the instrument rental one as an example, um, just because replacement of some of our large percussion instruments have you is, is fairly costly. And so it could take, you know, 50 years to recover the money that we, that we paid to, to buy some of those instruments. And I understand that, you know, primarily that instrument rental instruments. Um, but my understanding, at least it was at one point where um, teachers of those subjects could use some of that instrument rental money if it had accumulated and if their instruments were in good repair or if they needed to replace anything and they could maybe access some of those funds to replace instruments for the program. So I'm using the instrument rental fee as an example, but there may be other examples. Be extraordinarily expensive as well. Um, and you know we charge some for you know materials and so on for those classes, but just wondering how often do we reevaluate those program specific fees? So th through the chair, the CB attempts to review all fees on a continuous basis. You'll recall that under the previous government um, amendments were brought in or new regulations were put into place when the Education Act came into force that. Um, brought some rigor to the fee setting realm in public education. So as part of that, the CBE does its level best to uh, review fees on almost an annual basis so that when we develop our fee schedule for the year, we have some confidence that the fees that we're charging accurately reflect the cost of providing the related good or service. Uh, as part of that, we've struck a fee committee and that's a committee of principals. So school-based principals, some of the uh, education directors that oversee our um, 250 schools and there's representatives from uh, finance and technology services as, as well on that committee and the mandate of that committee is to review fees um, to work towards that annual creation of the fee schedule that is then posted online so that parents have a sense of what the, the fees are that they'll be facing for the coming school year. Uh, the fee committee is also charged with assessing affordability of CBE fees. Uh, we're very much alive to the fact that while one fee in isolation may seem reasonable, students and families can face a number of fees over the course of a school year. I would also acknowledge that you know nobody at the CBE truly wants to charge fees, uh, but it, fees are a reality of public education in the province of Alberta, and so we do our level best to make sure that the fees that we charge are accurately reflective of the actual cost of providing that good or service. So I'll stop there and if there's a follow-up I'm happy to respond as well. Trustee Dennis. No thank you. Just a, I guess a follow-up comment. Um, just appreciation for that work that does get done and um, I used to always tell families that paying that um, rental fee for instruments was going to be the least expensive music lessons their child was ever going to have. Um, so thank you. Trustee May, go ahead. 
I have another question on our um, financial health matrix on page 8-87. Um, so the average teacher salary and benefits, um, is this the average for FTE teachers only? And um, will the new four-year contract signed with the ATA affect this? So thank you for that question. Um, maybe I'll start with for the purposes of the uh, financial health matrix for the year ended August 31st, 2022. There was a minimal impact um, due to the recent ATA collective agreement settlement. There was only a portion of the year at a fairly low percentage that was uh, impacted. And um, as we move into the current school year, uh, we will be updating our average teacher salary, obviously, for the new information. But government has committed to funding the uh, salary increase. So basically it will be dollars in, dollars out for us. And so for the current school year, there will be no impact on, so for example, school-based budgets or the RAMs because the, the wage increase is fully funded. So if you had a, you know, 10 teachers in your school and they were funded at the previous rate um, and that rate goes up because of the collective agreement uh, increase, it's funded. And so there's no net impact on our schools. Hopefully that answers the question. Trustee May? Um, I'm just curious, uh, perhaps this isn't black and white since it is through a collective agreement, but is this for FTEs only or all teachers throughout our system? So let me just, uh, the average ATA salary noted in the chart is the average calculated for one teacher FTE on the RAM. Thank you. Trustees, any other questions or comments? Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. Question on MD&A 14, just regarding the National Sports School, there's just a comment on there. I'm curious, were there some leasehold improvements that we needed to manage as part of the transfer of the National Sports School to the Palliser School Division? So I'm just curious about that statement. So with regard to uh, Palliser, just let me flip to my notes, please. One second. I believe that the, uh, so the leasehold improvements uh, were made to the physical space at the National Sports School when we occupied them. Upon the closure of that program and its transfer to the other school jurisdiction, the associated leasehold improvements were removed from the books of the CBE. So you're just seeing the, uh, the, the net of that. Thank you. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thanks. On MD&A 10 under expenses, can you explain the $9.4 million increase in school activity rent costs with the matching revenue from school generated funds? Just wondering what that line is talking about, please. Uh, as schools were able to participate in more activities and events due to the relaxation of the COVID-19 restrictions, Schools had the ability to charge uh, fees for field trips, graduation events, and other school activities. These fees are based on the cost to provide the activity or the event and are cost neutral. That means that the CBE does not um, make any financial returns based on those activities and any fees generated flow through the school to cover the related costs. So the increase in expenses is the same as the revenue for noted for school generated funds. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, um, is there a trustee who wishes to bring forward a motion regarding this report? Trustee Dennis. 
Thank you. That the Board of Trustees approves the financial results of the Calgary Board of Education for the year ended August 31, 2022, including the audited financial statements for the year ended August 31, 2022, and the independent auditor's report dated November 29, 2022, for submission to the Minister of Education. Do trustees have any questions about the motion? The motion on the floor is that the Board of Trustees approves the financial results of the Calgary Board of Education for the year ended August 31st, 2022, including the audited financials statements for the year ended August 31st, 2022, and the independent auditor's report dated November 29th, 2022, for the submission to the Minister of Education. Trustee Denish, would you wish to open debate? Sure will, thank you. Uh, so the audit has demonstrated that the CBE is a well-run, fiscally well-managed organization with an extremely high degree of transparency. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the excellent work in terms of, like say, those fees, making sure that public education is affordable for every student who walks in our door, and also that we do the right thing by welcoming students um, into our, our schools just as soon as we can. Um, and the work that we do to try and make sure that they have the paperwork that they need to be eligible to be funded for education in Alberta. So um, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge those things that we do because they are the right things to do. Um, once again, our auditors praise the expertise of our finance team and the audit has signals agreement that the financial statements are an accurate and reasonable interpretation of the annual financial activity of the Calgary Board of Education. Trustees wishing to enter for round one of debate. Trustee Close, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I just want to echo uh, Trustee Dennis's comments. Um, you know, when you have a report in front of you that is so transparent that you're making corrections on the day of that we're approving, um, I appreciate that. Um, it's also uh, extremely clear uh, and easy to discern the information that CBE is fiscally prudent and well managed within the resources we have. We are definitely managing costs and assets in a sustainable way. Uh, it's also clear that there are budgetary pressures related to enrollment growth and inflation costs, and I really appreciated the clear and easy to understand management discussion and analysis. And of course, my favorite is the financial <laughs> health matrix, which uh, actually showcases our ability to achieve our results in the, both the short and the long term. But I think um, it would be, we would be remiss if we didn't comment on the longer term perspective that is challenging. Uh, we will feel the impact of the recent decline in the funding per student uh, with increased enrollment and continued cost increases resulting from inflation. Um, the deferred maintenance on our school inventory is now approaching, I thought it was 180 million, but maybe around 100 million is probably better when it's uh, discounted, uh, offset with what we can do. Um, but concerns exist about the overall level of government funding and should enrollment grow at rates of, uh, uh, above funding growth as a school system, we will be challenged to find new uh, and different and more efficient ways to provide high quality public education. But given all of that, um, easy to approve and submit to the Minister of Alberta Education. Thank you. I'll add in, in in round one, and again, echoing my colleagues, I do want to say uh, start off by saying I'm in favor of this motion. There was a lot of work that happened on administration side, audit and risk side, external members, our audit uh, auditors from KPMG. Um, administration does what it can with funds available from our provincial government. But I would like to draw the public's attention to this report and the per student funding. Although this is not the way government tracks funds for students, and I respect um, all the thought that went behind the predictable funding, the per student funding is a good metric for families to see. I appreciate the work admin has done to present this in a way that is accessible to families and <laughs> non-accountants. The per student funds are ones that go directly into teaching and learning. This is students per class. 
This is complexity per class. This affects families. Looking forward, if CBE's funds remain the same and we continue to see an increase in students to our system as we did this year, it means that families are going to see impacts for their children. It doesn't matter if we get more in the buckets of CMR, IMR, operations or capital, juggling those numbers. If the whole number does not increase, the whole child and the whole system will see impacts. Possibilities uh, being buildings, as, as Trustee Close pointed out, increased class sizes or complexity within the class, and in other ways that we can directly or indirectly affect students and their families. I, just, I do want to point out one other thing in relation to other provinces. Alberta went from being top three on funding per student, and Alberta students have historically performed extremely well, ranked in the world for public education. CB students do amazingly well, and for this administration, um, they should be so proud, and honestly, every student attending should be proud to be CBE. Although over the past few years, we are now middle of the road in comparing across Canada for the per student funding, my concern is where will that put Alberta students and specifically CBE students in five to 10 years down the road. I wanna thank administration again for the hard work that they do each and every day. Um, and in relation to this, to this audited uh, financial statements for the year ending August 31st, 2022. I, ask that my colleagues support the motion. Trustees wishing to enter or re-enter for round two of debate. Trustee Dennis, do you wish to close? Thank you. So I would like to offer my words of appreciation to Chief Usi, to our Superintendent of Finance and Technology Services, Chief Financial Officer and Corporate Treasurer, Brad Grundy, and also to Manager of Corporate Planning and Reporting, Tanya Skanga, and other finance staff who supported the work of this audit in managing our finances of this organization day in and day out. Also like to acknowledge um, the rest of our leadership team and also um, staff that are in our schools and area offices each day and how they work hard to manage well the dollars that are allocated to them to support students. I'd also like to thank our external audit and risk committee members uh, for sharing their expertise and knowledge with the Board of Trustees. Um, they do work as volunteers to support us in this work. Um, and their uh, financial oversight and assisting us with our financial oversight of the CBE is invaluable, and we appreciate them very much. Thank you. With that, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion? Trustee Downey? In favor. Thank you so much. That is carried unanimously. Next on our agenda is item 8.2, Louise Dean's school closure for the purpose of relocation compliance report. Chief Usi, would you please introduce the report? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, trustees, um, trustees will recall that on, Sept on September 27th, 2022, the Board of Trustees passed a motion to commence public input for the purpose of considering the re relocation of the Louis Dean School to Jack James High School. The report before the board today speaks to our compliance with legislation and board policy since the board's motion in September. At this time, I'd like to invite Superintendent Holoker to provide additional information and will certainly be happy to answer questions uh, from the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair and Board of Trustees, as a recap of the matter before you today, the Calgary Board of Education offers this specialized program within the former Kensington School, a facility that was constructed in 1947 and is in now need of significant investment, estimated to be in the order of 17 million to allow it to continue to serve students. You will also recall, however, that although the size of the required recapitalization within this building does factor as an important consideration, is actually not the most important consideration. 
The primary reason that this is being brought before the board relates to the wraparound supports Louise Dean students re receive from Kindred and Alberta Health Services. Why this factor weighs so heavily is that Calgary has experienced a citywide decline in the rate of teen pregnancies over the past 10 years. This has resulted in a corresponding decrease in enrollment at Louise Dean. However, since Kindred receives funding based on the number of students it supports, the continuing decline may threaten their ability to continue to provide off-site support, to provide on-site support for students at the isolated Kensington location. This includes services such as counseling, parental coaching, financial support workers, co-parenting courses, prenatal support, and on-site child care programming. These services have been an important component alongside the educational programming provided at the Louise Dean program. I will now hand it over to Superintendent Breton for some final remarks regarding compliance with legislation and board policy. Through the chair. The Education Act and the Board of Trustees policy, closure of schools procedures, GC3E, set out the formal process that must be followed when closures, even if in this case only for the purpose of relocation, um, are being considered. As a result, and further to the direction provided by the board on September 27th to initiate the public input process, the CBE has subsequently provided written notice to stakeholders of the proposed relocation, has posted notices of the public meeting, has held a public meeting, specifically on November 1st, and provided opportunities for the public to provide verbal and written input to the Board of Trustees. This most recent work comes in addition to the engagement uh, work that the CBE performed last spring when two in-person sessions were held with students at Louise Dean School, uh, specifically on May 16th and again on June 7th. Um, the one online session that was provided for students and all members of the public on May 25th uh, and as well an online survey that was conducted from May 13th to 29th. And in fact, this engagement work was actually built upon work done uh, between January to April of 2019, when meetings and initial discussions were held with Louise Dean students and partners, uh, but that were subsequently placed on hold due to various pressures at that time, pressures such as uh, certainly the pandemic and the need to finalize the high school engagement work to ensure enrollment could be balanced before the that demographic demographic bubble hit our high schools in 24-25. So accordingly today, we can confirm that a result of this work, we have complied with the requirements of the Education Act and of the board policy pertaining to school closures. And with this work now complete and the information now available to the Board of Trustees regarding this recommendation that is before you, we are available to answer any additional questions you might have. Trustees with questions or comments on the report. Trustee Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, and I understand that this may be a, a bit of a complex question, but I think important for trustees to understand. Um, why was this location chosen over any others that might have been considered? Um, and what features about this location, and I'm speaking of Jack James, of course, uh, placed it at the top of the list for the relocation of Louise Dean School? And conversely, what features of the other locations that might have been considered pulled them off of the list? Through the chair, uh, some of the primary considerations uh, in regards to the Jack James High School location as being the uh, location that was brought forward to you here um, this school year is in regards first and foremost to the capacity of the school so having the space to be able to accommodate the program um, something certainly that is, is quite challenging within CB high schools I, I, I referenced the high school engagement uh, just previously in the introductory re remarks and there's a recognition that there is uh, again that demographic bubble of, of future high school students starting to enter our high schools and that uh, will, will truly hit a peak 
uh, in, in the coming year. So we needed a school that had space. We were looking for a, a, a site that was well positioned for students. And in this case, uh, based on current, Jack, or I should say, Louis Dean student uh, residences, um, this site is actually closer and, and so helps reduce uh, transportation time. Um, and in fact, the ease of accessibility of that site in, in comparison, if I were to look at the Kensington site that is serviced by one bus, um, the Jack James High School is serviced by seven buses, uh, different bus routes. One of those bus routes being a max purple route. Uh, and so again, trying to reduce those barriers to uh, students being able to access the program. We were looking for an opportunity for our partners to be able to support more students as shared also as part of the introductory remarks. Um, specifically Kindred and the way that they are funded, um, that ability to support other students in an high school environment such as Jack James where they would have access to uh, students that uh, might require their services uh, could help enhance the uh, the funding and, and ultimately uh, help support maintain or maybe even grow the services that Kindred provides to the Louise Dean students as a result of that we were looking for an, a site that would also expand opportunities educational opportunities for the Louise Dean students um, the Kensington School certainly is, is limited. It was an elementary school, not uh, framed for high school um, educational opportunities to the same degree as a, as a high school like Jack James could offer. Um, and so in, in this case, again, there's that possibility for those students who might choose to um, select opportunities that exist within the Jack James side of the school, if we want to call it that, um, that they could do so, and in so doing, expand their opportunities. Other considerations um, certainly came down also to, inevitably, the, you know, the costs of the different options, um, and uh, some preliminary um, considerations. One preliminary site that was considered was certainly the, the Dr. Norman Bethune site, uh, and, and ultimately, the, the high costs that were identified for the, um, uh, the, the fit up of that site, uh, in addition to the fact, of course, that subsequently when we uh, were approached by uh, our partners looking for expanded access to students, it no longer uh, was as suited as in our uh, view as Jack James would be. Uh, and then, of course, uh, that, that uh, school was damaged uh, significantly by fire subsequently. And so those are the, the elements that, that really helped uh, land us at Jack James. Uh, its placement, our ability to uh, house the, not just the, the, the students, but all of the partners in one location. If you look at uh, Kensington School, um, the partners actually, some partners actually have to utilize modular classrooms that are are separate from the site, well, separate from the school. They're on the same site, of course. Um, it's closer location, ability to reduce transportation times using uh, public transportation. Uh, and, and for those other sites, they typically failed in one of those areas in a way that was marked enough uh, to drive us away. Uh, again, whether it was the cost to uh, fit up that facility, uh, the location, the placement of it, largely the capacity um, and, uh, and, and, and the desire, again, to have that high school um, age population to, to both uh, provide that programming as well as additional um, supports or population for the supporting uh, entities, our partners that would be coming across with Louise Dean. Trustee Wolcher, go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you speak to the flexibility and programming logistics that would be available to Louise Dean students should the move to Jack James be approved? And specifically, what I'm wondering is to what degree can student, or what, to what degree students are required to adhere to strict timetables, or are their schedules flexible enough that they can arrive or depart from school at non-peak times? 
through the chair. So flexibility is central to the success for Louise Dean students. And so the move to Jack James, if that is supported, would not in any way alter that. Um, Louise Dean students need to be met where they're at, both academically and in response to whatever life circumstances they have. Uh, students are always encouraged to uh, participate in the educational experience of the day for as long as they are able to, but certainly would be given the opportunity to flex their day, uh, both the start and end times, as well as any, um, any need for breaks in dur and during the school day. Uh, that is a central component to Louise Dean. So that would certainly be a priority that would be supported by staff and uh, definitely looking at individual student needs for that flexibility as we move forward. Trustee Bukadinovich. I've heard from many stakeholders sharing their concerns about Louise Dean School being integrated with a regular mainstream high school if this uh, move were to take place. But when I read the report from administration, my understanding is that Louise Dean Centre students would not be integrated or amalgamated with the Jack James High School student body. So I would like additional clarity around this, please. Will the students be mixed? Will they have common classes, common spaces, common hallways, common cafeteria, common library? Through the chair. So the Louise Dean School proposal before you um, would see dedicated spaces uh, for the Louise Dean School. And those areas, um, in fact, uh, would be only accessible by Louise Dean students. And so for if a student wishes, and as part of the, the discussion I was, uh, or the, the comments I was mentioning previously, if a Louise Dean student does wish to reach out to uh, access uh, programming that's available on the Jack James front, and so if there's a, a, a course offering there that they're interested in, they would have that ability to exit the Louise Dean School space, go attend that, and then reintegrate the Louise Dean School uh, using card access control. We would ensure that any of those doors within the school would only be, uh, could only be used by Louise Dean students. So I think that's, that's really the strength. Uh, those students that wish to, to remain within the Louise Dean School and, and fulfill their uh, high school uh, within that environment and not feel a need to go any, uh, anywhere else within that building could do so and not have to transition through those other areas. Whereas those students within Louise Dean that do wish to access, that, that do see a value for that, could do so and then come back to the Louise Dean space if they feel that there are uh, moments where they, they need that additional sense of community or just to return to the regular uh, programming that the Louise Dean School would have offering, uh, would be offering them. I've got Trustee Downey with a question. Thank you, Chair Hack. Bear with me a moment, please. So Kindred is a value partner of the CBE. I'm wondering if our ability to continue providing services to Louise Dean students depends completely on the support of Kindred or if the CBE has been able to consider other service providers that might be able to provide services to a smaller population without access to additional CBE students. So through the chair, uh, thank you for that question, Trustee Downey. Uh, Kindred has been a very valuable partner to Louise Dean for many years. Um, certainly the success of one partnership does not preclude exploring other partnerships. Um, however, uh, it, it would be our belief that uh, other agencies would be um, similarly pressed to serve a decreased amount of students or clients in their case. Um, and so therefore it would not be simply a concern specific to one partner, but rather uh, providing such discrete services to a small amount of students uh, would be problematic, what we believe would be problematic uh, to any organization we would choose to partner with. 
So if we were to move to a different partner, they would probably also express the same concern about the small amount of clientele, uh, given that uh, within that sector, their funding would be similar in that they are receiving per client funding, and therefore they too would be looking for servicing uh, that to a greater amount of clients and looking for those solutions within the CBE, similarly to what Kindred is stating. Thank you. I'm just going to go back to what was uh, previously asked, and I just want crystal clear clarity here. Um, so on page uh, six, the CB acknowledges the importance of shelter programming, which my colleague Trustee Bukadinovich um, spoke to, as well as further down on page six, currently there's one main point of, of entry. You said that students would be able to leave that space to go over to Jack James should they choose. Um, does this mean that there will be a separate entrance created? Through the chair. And so I, I'm going to respond to this one both in terms of the inside of the school and the outside of the school. So what I was speaking to previously was certainly from the inside of the school. Yes, there would be dedicated entrances that would be controlled uh, so as to only allow Louise Dean's students that are inside the building to uh, transit from the Jack James portion of the building into the Louise Dean school uh, portion of the building. During the November 1st session, now if I move to the exterior entrance, um, we heard from, uh, uh, from concerned individuals in regards to a dedicated external um, entrance. And at that time, we also indicated that we would be looking to explore that further. Uh, of course, the, 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 the drawing, the plan that you saw before you on no November 1st um, is just a concept at this time. I, I do like to understand, uh, to underscore that because of the fact that, of course, a decision has not yet been made, and so we cannot be in a situation where we're presupposing the outcome and, and investing time and effort to prepare drawings and specifications on something like this, but this was a concept. Having explored that possibility of a, a dedicated entrance, I, I'm pleased to say that uh, we are in a position to be able to ensure that that happens from an exterior perspective as well. And in fact, just as a little additional bonus, uh, the location of that entrance comes with a stairwell that's already in place and would allow um, students on the first floor of the Louise Dean School to then also transition to the second story of the Louise Dean uh, proposal uh, without having to transition through the Jack James uh, High School common areas as, was, as per what had been proposed on November 1st. So that stairwell actually makes for a nice link between the second floor and the first floor. Um, in addition to including that external entrance. And one follow up. Does this include, and I, I, maybe I didn't see it on the original plans or just wanted to ask that question. Does that include a dedicated bathrooms for the mothers of the Louise Dean program? To the chair, it, correct. Yes, uh, there are washrooms uh, within the Louise Dean school for staff and students. Thank you. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering if, so pages, uh, I believe it's 164 to 167 um, of the report have illustrations. And again, I understand, appreciate that these are not final drawings, but just sort of um, initial, initial just ideas. But when you say there is room for an external door and an internal door, uh, both actually would help me. Do you have a rough sense, or could you show me on those diagrams where I would look um, to see where the external door would go and where the internal door would go? Because be, uh, part of my challenge in understanding this is when I look at the diagram, the the main floor um, uh, uh, offerings are on the uh, north uh, east corner, and the top floor offerings are on the southwest corner. So I'm not quite. I, I just need to help picturing how how they're connected and, and separated from the rest of Jack James High School. Through the chair. Um, so the orientation of the drawing uh, does lead to confusion. The rightmost portion of the drawing is actually the north, and uh, the leftmost portion is, is the south, so that means the top is west and the bottom is east. So now if you're looking at the drawing that has the first floor, 
uh, indicated on it. Um, there is in the top right hand corner that large purple box um, and let me just have a quick look here again. You will see in the bottom left hand corner of that large purple rectangle in the gray there is a stairwell there and there's an existing exit and entrance. There are two doors. If you're able to zoom in, you will see that. That is the proposed location for the dedicated entrance to the Louise Dean School that would allow immediate access into the first floor um, or going up the stairs. And then if, if uh, you go to the next drawing that shows the second floor, um, there is at the top of that stairwell, you can see the stairwell which is sort of like in the middle and to the left now on that drawing you can see the purple Louise Dean section. Well if you look at the uh, stairwell, the, the, the concept here is that we would have a connection that would be or essentially we'd put up a wall so that we would not allow and uh, we would disconnect that stairwell from the remainder of the Jack James School and have that stairwell then connecting directly over to that leftmost portion of the Louise Dean second floor. I hope that helped make sense. Thank you. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a couple of questions just in um, understanding, I guess, stability. Um, we know that this conversation has, you know, began in early 2019 around you know transitioning Louise Dean to a different location um, and so in this case our partner has been very clear that their ability to maintain services to Louise Dean students is predicated on their ability to be able to expand the number of students that they serve and within the same building so based on your conversations with the partner does the enrollment at Jack James suitably fulfill that requirement when combined with our Louise Dean student population through the chair yes uh, they have shared that they would be able to reinvest some of their services into the Jack James community and that would therefore serve an expansion of both the number of clients and the types of services they could provide to the community as a whole and that would allow them to continue in in to the same extent the on-site programming and support to louise dean students so in in summary yes it would meet their needs trustee dennis thank you um i guess second question in um with sort of that lens of stability um and you know the recommendation would propose that um, should it go forward that the Louise Dean School would occupy the space starting in September of 2024. So in terms of timing for the proposed construction um, to prepare the location for Louise Dean and make the modifications necessary to accommodate their needs, uh, with the impact of possible labor shortages and maybe challenges um, of getting materials in time, um, you know, I'm thinking about some of the constructions that delays that we've experienced with some of our new schools this year. Um, just have we allowed enough time to get the work completed? How confident do we feel that we can, um, you know, say to these students that they will have a they will have a space ready by September 2024? Through the chair. Um, so. In the event that a decision was taken today to relocate this school to Jack James, um, we'd actually have approximately 21 months to get things in, in, in order, almost two years. Um, based on our preliminary review, again, just working off that uh, concept plan and, 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 and based on our experience with um, the, the current conditions in the market, we would anticipate that we would be able to complete the work by the March to April timeframe of 2024. So about 16 months out. I'm, I'm not counting December as, as being that productive. When I say 16 months, that still leaves another four months for any slippage that might occur. Having said that, if the worst 
you know, we end up being really, really unlucky all the way through. Um, the beauty of this is, of course, that the students can continue within their existing facility, and then when there's a, 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 an appropriate um, time uh, for the students to make that transition that wouldn't impact their learning uh, outcomes at that point in time, we could choose what that date would be, and they would relocate into the newly renovated areas on that date. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you. Through the chair, um, earlier I, I mentioned that um, many uh, letter writers shared their concerns about Louise Dean Centre being integrated with a regular mainstream high school. And from what you're saying, it sounds to me like it, integrated is not a, an accurate way to describe it, that they are separate spaces. But the other aspect of that is about Jack James being a regular mainstream high school. A number of letters reference Jack James High School as, as um, regular mainstream community high school, which is, it no longer is. So could admi administration share with me the history of this high school? Why was the Jack James High School built so close to Forest Lawn High School? Did both high schools operate as regular mainstream community high schools at one time? When did Jack James High School change over to serving a population of students with unique needs who are best served with a small, specialized setting? to fully nourish their gifts and meet their full potential. So through the chair, Jack James was originally built and set up as one of three integration, integrated occupational program, which was called IOP schools, uh, now called Knowledge and Employability or k and &E. And so this served to provide vocational programming and high amounts of CTS programming to the students at that site. It also facilitated small class instruction as a result of the IOP and the CTS programming. Of those three, Jack James is the only one that remains and it still serves those needs, although it has expanded and uh, continues to retain the high levels of CTS and K&E programming, but also serves to support academic and other complementary courses. So some students from Forest Lawn do attend Jack James High School for some courses and vice versa. So there, there are students who do so. Um, this is based on student desire and, need, and their choice for programming. And certainly uh, that occurs uh, to some extent in other areas of the city as well, where schools are in close proximity to each other. And again, really looking at this as a way to support um, both communities but uh, I'd say for Jack James, it really has maintained that um, k &E programming with the emphasis on CTS and really um, has grown to become a very important facility for students uh, in a way that provides wraparound services and care for students with um, great needs. Trustee May, go ahead. So I understand that Jack James has an award-winning preschool. The report states that Louise Dean would continue to have a daycare and both of these would be separate entities. But um, just to confirm, will having the daycare on site take away any current spaces or resources um, away from the current functioning preschool? Through the chair, uh, so no it would not. So we've taken great care in our preliminary planning to ensure that the award-winning child care program at Jack James could continue. It certainly benefits the students of Jack James who participate in child care courses to receive high school credit. And it benefits the community as a child care provider. So any child care that would come along with a proposed relocation of Louise Dean would create an additional child care site specifically for Louise Dean students. Thank you. Trustee Vukadinovich, go ahead. My next uh, question is around the uh, disparaging comments directed towards the community of children, youth and families connected to Jack James High School. And these are comments I have read in the media and heard at the public meeting uh, in early November and, and, and that I received as a trustee. As a trustee for the area, I have met Jack James High School students and I have also met Jack James High School parents, grandparents and guardians. And my impression is that Jack James High School is known for having some of the most polite, most kind, and most thoughtful high school students in Alberta. Yet despite my very positive impressions, a number of letter writers wrote, letter writers wrote that Jack James High School is known for bullying, violence, and drugs. 
Was this perhaps true of Jack James High School at one time, but not true anymore? And what can you tell me about the character and behavior of students at Jack James High School? Through the chair, so we appreciate hearing the comments that you have made and the reflections because they certainly align with how we view the staff and the students and administration at Jack James High School and also how they view their school community. Um, all staff members there work really closely with each student to provide that individualized support and really focus on providing safe and caring learning environments and other supports for the students who attend the school. So Jack James is an environment where students are welcomed and supported each day as individuals and are really supported as well on their journey to high school completion. So I would say that your impression of Jack James would be the same as what the school community sees themselves as. Thank you. Trustee Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, you know, certainly the decision before us today is the um, possible closure for relocation to Jack James for Louise Dean, but um, Jack James community is going to be a receiver of this community should this recommendation move forward. And so I don't want to, um, I guess, neglect thinking about them as well. Um, we know that regular attendance at Louise Dean is roughly um, 10 students at any given time. Um, but there is a possibility for more because enrollment is at least four times higher than that. Um, and also considering the impact on the Jack James community, how do the planned renovations account for typical and possible attendance of Louise Dean students while also ensuring that Jack James student learning will not be adversely impacted by the modifications to their building? Through the chair. So the space that is being designed for the Louise Dean, or that has been uh, conceived of uh, as part of the Louise Dean School um, would accommodate 60 students. And so that would be the, uh, the, the essentially the, the number that we could accommodate within that space and, and work with. Uh, recognizing, of course, again, though, that at the high school level, um, students aren't necessarily attending um, and using all of the spaces simultaneously, not just within the Louise Dean School, but also within a Jack James High School space. So certainly, Jack James is, uh, is, is a high school with a utilization rate that uh, is in the mid-80s or close to. And um, based on our experience that we've had within the CBE in high schools, we know that exactly what I was talking about, the fact that students, due to their, um, their, their, their timetables, uh, won't necessarily be using all spaces at all times. Um, there is space to be able to uh, take from the existing building and include the, the Louise Dean School and still be able to continue to offer um, everything that Jack James has within the space that remains. Essentially, you know, like we would all do, uh, when you have more space, you look to make maximum use of it, whether that's in your home or a principal within their school. They will obviously fill the entire space that they have to uh, maximize the, the results for, for students. And now it's just a matter of having to adjust to things being moved around, but those, those things will still be there. Those offerings that were previously within the Louise Dean spaces, um, as part of the proposal that was shared, the concept that was shared on November 1st, you'll have noted that there were orange boxes uh, that were identified, and those were areas where we're renovating Jack James spaces to recreate um, um, features that they uh, were giving over to the Louise Dean School and now needed to be recreated within the remaining space. And so through that, both Louise Dean School students uh, can be accommodated, and, and even if we find that suddenly there's a resurgence um, in pregnant and pregnanting teams or, or, or a large number that decide to attend at the same time for whatever reason might happen, we would have that capacity within uh, that proposed location. And in the Jack James School, um, all of the um, uh, uh, programming that they had access to previously would 
would be recreated if, if any of that happened to be located within the Louise Dean School's portion uh, within their existing school and that space um, needing to, to be used a little bit differently, certainly a lot more intensely than it was in the past and, and certain, uh, probably as a result uh, not uh, left vacant as often as potentially happening now. Next, we'll go to Trustee Downey, if you want to turn on your camera. Thank you, Chair Hack. Um, so in the compliance report on page three, um, there's the suggestion that if this motion moves forward, uh, that it would be financially responsible um, for the CBE to declare Kensington School surplus. And I'm wondering, uh, would the CBE be unable to sell the Kensington School for a monetary gain uh, if we are instructed to keep the building for other uses as directed by the Ministry of Education? Through the chair, um, the, the Minister of Education, uh, through the powers uh, invested in her under the Education Act, uh, has the ability to direct school jurisdictions in, in certain regards, and certainly this is one area uh, where that might be a, a consideration that she might have uh, and, and choose not to um, follow the recommendations of the Calgary Board of Education. Um, certainly only time would tell as to what she would choose to do in that regards. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hack. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the financial aspect of it a bit. Sorry, we keep jumping around from topic to topic, but we have a lot of questions. So I understand that uh, the, the required renovations and the financial aspect is a factor, but not the main factor, because the main factor is uh, that Kindred, the way they're funded, um, they, they're looking for an opportunity to be able to serve a larger number of students, and that's the main driver. But, but going back to the financial part of it, um, in the comments, I heard a number of stakeholders reference that the CBE has $40 million in capital funding that could be used to repair the Kensington site. I would, like to, I would like additional clarity around this. What is the size of the CBE's capital reserves? How much of it is available for discretionary spending? And what competing interests does the CBE have for existing capital reserves? Does the CBE have any other outstanding repairs and maintenance? So through the chair, um, the board of trustees has recently approved the audited financial statements for the um, year ending August 31st, 2022. At In that document and at that time, the CBE's capital reserves are listed at 49.881 million. So just shy of $50 million, which admittedly sounds like a fairly significant um, amount. However, as always, there is context that needs to be considered so of that $50 million, approximately $22 million is related to various capital project carry forwards. So that's uh, capital projects that are currently, un are currently underway in that school year and have been, uh, the projects continue into the current school year. So of that $50 million, approximately 22 million relates to that, which leaves a net balance of approximately 28 million. You will recall that the Board of Trustees recently approved uh, the use of up to $8.6 million of capital reserves to support the fit up or the commissioning of the North High School. So that $28 million is now more like $20 million. You'll also know that in our school capital plan, we have a request in for another high school and another middle school. Uh, should those come to pass, the uh, fit up costs or the commissioning costs for those schools is probably in the nature of around $12 million. So your $20 million is now uh, down to about $8 million. I would also then offer that uh, within the next decade, we know that approximately 70% of our 250 schools will be more than 50 years old. So that deferred maintenance that we were discussing uh, briefly previously is uh, ever present uh, consideration and having sufficient dollars in our capital reserve to address the unanticipated uh, impact of having a large number of very old, old buildings is important. 
We're also aware that the federal government has committed to a net zero target for carbon emissions by 2050. And so we are anticipating that there will be significant work required in all sorts of public buildings, including schools, uh, to potentially either install um, sort of environmentally friendly energy generation options or uh, convert or and or convert uh, carbon-based heating systems and whatnot to something that's more sustainable. So there's significant costs there. I think it's also important to know that um, the primary source of funding for the CBE's capital reserves is the sale or disposition of properties that were purchased prior to 1985 uh, when the joint use uh, agreement came into effect. And that's an ever dwindling population of school buildings. So you know, while we have had um, some dispositions over time that have tended to bring our capital reserves up, that's not an ongoing and continuing source of funding. So long story short, yes, we have about $50 million of capital reserves, uh, but when you apply the context, it's a very modest amount, probably in the 10 to $15 million range, all inclusive uh, after considering things like deferred maintenance, um, the, the um, net zero, and any other factors that may occur between now and some future date that we'll need to fund. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Vukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hack. Another uh, finance-related uh, question. I read in the stakeholder comments that the CBE could raise money to cover the $17 million cost of keeping the school in its current location by renting surplus buildings to charter schools. How much in annual rent is the CBE able to charge to each charter school? Would this be an effective way to raise $17 million? Through the Chair. Um, so, Alberta Education requires school jurisdictions to lease uh, schools to charter schools for a dollar a year. And so that would not be an effective means to generate $17 million. It, it's simply uh, unattainable and would require a significant change to the Alberta Education direction in regards to leasing. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just want to put our focus back on the um, students in the Jack James community. And so this recommendation does um, see kindred staff and possibly other services um, offered on site. Just wondering, do we, how do we see um, this benefiting Jack James students? Through the chair. So uh, with this proposed relocation, uh, Jack James students will continue to benefit from the learning supports they currently have in place, because I know we've already mentioned uh, what a stellar staff and site Jack James is already doing to serve the community. Um, but there will be benefits. Um, there's, there could be some educational benefits where Jack James would have opportunity to participate in some courses, should that be appropriate. Um, but the biggest benefit would be the addition of Kindred and their services and potentially Alberta Health Service as well to be able to provide those services to a greater amount of students. Uh, so in the case of Jack James, uh, they would be able to work with students and certainly providing the supports that they have in place for Louise Dean students and looking to support that in the larger Jack James community as well. So that includes social supports, financial literacy, success coaches, and uh, support with cultural diversity. And so these would allow for some of our Jack James students to benefit from of those services that Louise Dean students would. And certainly many of those are, um, are opportunities that could benefit a broader school community, no matter where it is. Um, but for the, for the situation with Jack James as well, given that it is a high school environment and it allows for students to participate in programming, um, we also had uh, recognized that our current Louise Dean site didn't provide the opportunity at this time for um, co-parenting opportunities for dads or partners to be present. And so part of the benefit that could occur to Jack James would be if it was, again, an individual uh, situation that made sense for that individual and for the school, for a father to be present and be part of the Jack James community, 
that, they, that would allow them to A, participate in the programming I just mentioned, but also could participate in co-parenting opportunities, which are certainly in the long run, um, at, at usually in the best interests of the student and the parent. Trustee May, go ahead. Are you able to speak to community or neighborhood resources that are available to current students? Are there any programs, buildings, facilities? Yes, through the chair, there are quite a bit of uh, neighborhood resources around Jack James School. Um, there is an Awo Tan Parent Link Center, and that is uh, very close by, and it's parent education and early childhood development services for both parents and children. There is a Triple P Positive Parenting Program, and that provides outreach services, home visits, emergency food champ hampers, and court support. It also provides healing circles and services for men and women, and youth mentorship services. Um, very close by is, East, is the East Calgary Health Center, and this provides counseling, community health, immunization, early childhood, and perinatal health. Uh, it has a neonatal transition team, postpartum community services, preschool oral health, and well child services. And beyond those sort of social supports, also within the community, there's the Bob Bayhan Aquatic and Fitness Center and the Forest Lawn Library. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so understanding that our um, students that we serve through Louise Dean, um, you know, come from, I guess, uh, various circumstances and um, certainly um, being young and pregnant would add to some of the complexities in their life. Um, and whether it be trauma or other things um, that have had them land there. I guess in order for them to be able to engage in their learning and be able to concentrate on um, the work that they need to do to better themselves for their, you know, for their own good and for the good of their babies, just um, it's important, I think, I would for them to know that they're while they are engaging in their own growth and learning that their you know children or babies are in a place that's safe on site um, and you know in under good care and so can you just explain um, should this recommendation move forward what safety features or procedures might be in place to give um, these young moms um, assurance that their that their babies and children are safe in their separate daycare facility. So through the chair, the uh, licensed child care facility that is currently part of the Louise Dean site is, uh, is licensed, which means that they must be compliant with standards for child care in accordance with the Child Care Act. And that would need to continue uh, if they did move to another site, if, as they would continue to be a licensed child care provider. But specific to um, the child care services that Kindred provides, they currently have very, uh, I'd say, strict adherence to a locked door policy. So the door, even within the current Louise Dean site, is locked uh, at all times and the only access to the children are with that particular mother uh, or parent at Louise Dean currently, and or by written permission for someone else, such as a grandparent, to take the child at that time. Um, That's not even afforded to the staff at Louise Dean to be taking those children out of the childcare site, again, because it's a licensed childcare facility. So that would be the same model that would be utilized at Jack James, uh, would be to ensure that there is that locked door um, and that it is only the parent who has access to the child unless they've given written authorization for someone else to do so. I guess just as we, as we wait for any other trustees who have questions or comments, I'm going to uh, 
I did, I did quite a bit of uh, background on this, and I know you referenced this, um, the 2019 um, reports that were done in relation to this. So on our public web, web page as part of my due diligence when considering this, um, there's a whole page on accommodation, planning, and engagement for the possible relocation of the Louise Dean Centre. On there are fulsome documents about public input um, and other documents provided there. On the March 18th, 2019 public meeting, um, it states the based on priority, priorities identified by the school, we began the process of elimination. And it states that all elementary schools were moved as they had limited or no access to CTS spaces as required by the program. I can agree that our elementary schools don't have that, so I can understand um, the thought process in removing elementaries from that list. Um, most of our middle or junior high schools are at or near capacity at the time in 2019. Uh, those with space had insufficient space to meet the program demands outlined by the schools. Based on what we know now, I have a question in relation to this, relation to the decreasing enrollment in the Louise Dean Centre. Were middle schools considered before bringing the most recent document to us? Through the chair, um, middle schools were not uh, a consideration because of the desire to ensure that Louise Dean students, um, and more importantly, the Louise Dean student partners, could have access to that uh, critical mass of students to be able to continue providing the supports to the Louise Dean students and to another population. And so that was a consideration that, was, that did not form part of the discussion uh, back in 2019 when this, was first, this, this consideration was first brought to, to um, the public. It was not something that uh, was being contemplated. Um, and, then, and then again, um, it's the fact that uh, a high school can provide additional uh, educational opportunities to those Louise Dean students should they choose to exercise those options. And, and if they did, it, it's there within a high school. If we weren't in a high school, then there was that additional element where they would not have the same benefit of a, of a larger grouping of high school students that make other educational opportunities possible. Thank you. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. In, uh, of course, earlier we heard that the proposed new location will be closer to home and reduce travel time for a greater proportion of Louise Dean Centre students. Uh, but I was surprised to learn by, in reading the report that uh, there are pregnant and parenting teens who, uh, who are not attending Louise uh, Dean High School. And, um, and in weighing how I will vote later, I, I am trying to consider both the current students and meeting their needs, but also the, the needs of potential students who are perhaps could be accessing the space and aren't currently. So um, is it possible that this new location could address any of the barriers um, um, in place that for pregnant and parenting teens who are currently not attending? Louise Dean Center for, for a variety of factors? Through the chair. So um, I, maybe I, I'll start off by saying that the CBE didn't go out and conduct a survey within the broader community to see if this location might attract some uh, students who currently are attending other schools um, or have chosen to, to, to uh, wait until the time was right to resume their high school um, education. Um, so all I can really comment on is the fact that there are more routes. And so there are, again, six uh, bus routes plus the Max Purple uh, route that are all within walking distance of uh, the Jack James site. Um, and conceivably, um, that additional number of routes will reduce barriers to access, um, but then, you know, every student is unique, and so uh, I, I really can't comment as to whether or not this might uh, influence some students. Trustee Bukadinovich, follow-up? Thank you, Chair Hack. Um, 
so this one isn't a follow-up. I'm, I'm, I wanted to go back to the space um, conversation that we were having earlier. Um, so when I look at the illustrations on pages 164 to 167 of the 172-page document, uh, just l seeking some clarity, are the three new classrooms envisioned for Louise Dean Centre on the second floor an addition, or does this space already have three existing classrooms? And if it is an addition, would would this uh, impact a, a shop on the main floor? Through the chair. So um, within the concept on the second floor, as you accurately identified, three classroom spaces, two of those are pre-existing. The third that is being proposed to be created uh, would be taken from the mezzanine of the auto body shop below it. And so that would mean that as part of the investment, there would be need to invest in the auto body shop to relocate some pieces of equipment. Uh, but again, the auto body shop would be able to continue to offer everything that it has uh, previously uh, within the, the space that would be reconfigured so as to allow that mezzanine to become a classroom. Trustee Bukadinovic. And regarding the, uh, the, the main floor spaces that um, uh, would potentially be um, redeployed for the use of Louise Dean Centre students, my understanding is that uh, those, those spaces are currently being used for the Jack James High School art program, computer tech program, and digital media program. Where are these programs going to move to so students who have started them will be able to complete uh, senior level classes? Um, and uh, yeah, basically, how, um, where will they be re relocated and how will the needs of the current users be met in the future? Through the chair. Um, and so as I mentioned previously, on those concept plans that were shared. There are some areas within the Jack James High School that are uh, highlighted in orange that uh, will require modifications or require renovations to accommodate um, uh, offerings that are currently within the proposed Louise, Louise Dean uh, location. Um, other programs and, and offerings that are provided within that space uh, may be relocated, but without a need for renovation. Uh, but ultimately, the Jack James programming does not change as part of this. Yes, I have no doubt that for uh, the principal and, and staff, there'll be a little bit more uh, timetable juggling of the spaces because of the fact that uh, they will be more compressed within what's uh, what the, the, the new footprint of the Jack James High School. Uh, but the intent is to ensure that they continue to be able to uh, con continue offering uh, everything that they currently offer to their students. Sorry, and I'll just add as well that right now there are, again, because it's not at full utilization, although it's being well used, um, some of the spaces that are being used are flexible learning spaces for students. So being able to shift some of the classroom spaces that don't require the sort of the big fit ups of heavy equipment and so on, uh, being able to move those, it, it, there's a, the opportunities afforded within the footprint that there is now because it's not at 100% utilization. Trustee Vukadinovic. So, um, uh, no, thank you, Chair Hack. We've, you've touched on this already, but just for, for more clarity, um, what spaces or programming would Louise Dean's Centre students be able to access in the main building? Is it the, the, would it be the Jack James High School Library, or would they have a separate library, the Jack James High School Gym, or would they have a separate gym, CTS facilities? Will, would LDC and Jack James students be using these at the same time? Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering to how Jack James students might react to see um, pregnant students in these spaces or students chest feeding their babies in these spaces. 
Well, I'll, uh, through the chair, I'll start. And if it becomes a technical building discussion, I know my colleague, Superintendent Breton, will jump in as well. Um, I, again, it's really important to emphasize that this would be an individual student choice. So we would have the fully sheltered programming that is already present within Louise Dean. And that would be, as I think it's been presented, fully closed off and available only to the students of Louise Dean. So for students that would be interested in considering moving into other courses that are offered within the school plant, it would be because there is the comfort that's there uh, for them to be able to engage in those studies amongst other students. So it would never be forced. Um, the program that's there we know is, is robust in being able to meet those students' needs and help them move towards graduation. So we would want to continue to have those in place in a sheltered way. Um, but the opportunity for them to expand into other programming would be there should that be determined for them. Um, the other components where they would have counseling supports, um, medical supports, the chest feeding and so on, those would be in spaces that would absolutely be not permitted for others uh, that of the Jack James community and in fact even other Louise Dean students. Um, there's a tremendous amount of privacy built into the program because of those other components. So there wouldn't be uh, ever a space where a student would need to feel that they're exposed while doing those very uh, sort of intimate parenting activities with their child. Trustee May. Just kind of following up with uh, Trustee Vukadinovich, just a question around gym space. Um, physical education is a requirement for graduation, correct? Um, and so if so, are they able to take, I know you said when they move over to, if they were to move over to Jack James, everything would kind of be the same core programming. Are there still going to be flexibility um, and comfortability with, with doing the physical education requirement? So through the chair, so again, just want to emphasize that Louise Dean currently supports students to be able to re receive that requirement in their programming, and so they would still be able to do so. Um, again, this would be something where if the student's individual program uh, and their desire had them want to participate into a larger phys ed classroom or programming, they would have the opportunity to do so. But if not, then Louise Dean in their sheltered programming would be able to do so much like they are currently. And through the chair, I would add that it is only physical education 10, so it really is dependent on when a student is entering into the program uh, as to whether or not that is part of that particular programmatic need, hence my colleague's reference to the personalized design. Trustee Bukadinovich. Well, just a point of clarity to what uh, Trustee May was just asking, because Louise Dean Center, being a former elementary school, do they have access to a gym now, or is that not available? Because you said it would be the same as what's current, what they currently have. So through the chair. Uh, the programming would be the same. So it may not be the same spaces, right? But there would be flexible programming spaces for students within the Jack James site, within their sheltered space, that they would be able to have enough space to be able to meet the requirements of their grade 10 phys ed program should they need it through, uh, through the Louise Dean shelter programming. So that is what is currently happening at Louise Dean in the Kensington site, which is a space that is quite uh, condensed on a small elementary site would not have the same access to a large phys ed program like a larger high school. So the Louise Dean um, staff has been very supportive in being able to help those students get their grade 10 phys ed credit in order to move them to graduation. Um, that would be that sort of creative programming would be allowable. Um, also just to keep in mind that um, there's a lot of flexibility um, no pun intended, uh, in trying to support the students with their learning, um, given that many of them are pregnant or in a postnatal phase and they're engaging in that learning and support. So it's, it's a fairly um, individualized programming that is modified to what they're capable of. And certainly looking at, uh, for all of our students, what are the outcomes required in the Phys Ed 10 program and how can this be met uh, to individually support that student in order to receive that. Trustee Vukadinovich. 
Another gym related question. So from the stakeholder comments, I, I'm reading that the school gym is always busy um, for the, the child care centre program. So will, uh, if the program were to move to Jack James High School, will there be an indoor gym space for babies and kids? Because I can appreciate what you're saying that um, uh, a high school uh, phys ed 10 program with, with a few students is not the same thing as a, as a whole class. But, but for the babies and kids the, in, the, in our cold winters, they appreciate that opportunity to run around. Through the chair. So <clears throat> similarly, uh, we would not see a, a high school gym as an appropriate place for babies and toddlers to be running around. Um, so with there, yes, the answer very clearly is yes, there is uh, plans in the renovation should it move forward to accommodate the building of an indoor gym space for the babies and toddlers of, uh, of the Louise Dean students. Chelsea Bugadinovich. Thank you, Chair Hack. Another space-related question. Um, at the Jack James location, would there be a shared common gathering space for just Louise Dean Centre students? And I'm asking because um, I'm, I'm, from the public consultation and from the comments I'm reading, I, I, I'm really getting a sense that a sense of community is what makes the Louise Dean Centre a powerful, supportive, encouraging program. So here I'm not talking about classroom learning space. Um, but rather a, a safe space to talk and socialize um, for Louise Dean Centre students without Jack James High School students. And if a social gathering hub is planned, where in the diagrams on page, pages 164 to 167 would this common social gathering space be located? Uh, so through the chair, I'll answer um, the, the question, but I will not refer to the diagram. I'll leave that to my superintendent engineer expert beside me um, yes the short answer is yes so it is expected that there will be flexible gathering spaces for Louise Dean students albeit smaller because of course it wouldn't be on the same scale as a large high school so there'll be spaces designated for Louise Dean students um, on both floors as uh, superintendent Breton did point out and certainly these spaces are large enough to house an area for Louise Dean students to gather um, additionally there's going to be spaces where students uh, in Louise Dean can gather where they access their meals um, certainly some of that informal gathering may occur also in their child care and feeding spaces when they're engaging in that activity um, but it is also important to acknowledge that the primary reason for Louise Dean students to be at Louise Dean School is to be in attendance of their classes. And so while we do recognize the importance of gathering areas at all of our schools and for Louise Dean, we want to also make sure we're balancing that with providing educational spaces for them. We're going to take about a five minute recess here and come back to any last questions that trustees have in relation to this report.
Okay, I'm going to reconvene this meeting. Um, trustees with any questions or comments on the report? Trustee Vukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hack. Um, my understanding is that part one of the many, many things that make it special is that the program offers They're preparing food, even bringing food home uh, for the children's clothes and in good repair. Will that Yes. Uh, so the programming to the students. So um, if this were to be the relocation. be looking at um, making sure that, again, in the transition planning, we would be figuring out which courses are the most important programs could continue and, sh and we anticipate would continue at Jack James uh, because we know that the program to Louise Dean students and therefore would be offered at Jack James. Um, however, it would probably be uh, important to ask the students, just like we do with many of our high schools, uh, what are the courses that you're interested in participating in, uh, using that, uh, which likely could grow and change over time, to determine what is the programming interest of those students, uh, and then moving it down to the individual basis uh, to see if there's any opportunity for them to engage in Jack James programming. Should that be of interest to them, which could then broaden some of their experiences in those CTS courses. So in summary, the answer is yes, we would make sure that the components of programming that are important at Louise Dean would move over with the Jack James program. Trustee May, go ahead. I'd like to ask um, a question around identity, because I think that's just really important for our students and staff. Um, so they're kind of interrelated. So is Louise Louise Dean a coded school? Will they retain that code if so? Um, will they retain their name? Um, will the intention remain the same? Or are they expected to kind of fall under the banner of Jack James? So through the chair, yes to all of those. So they certainly are, do have a discrete school code from Alberta Education. They would continue to be considered a discrete school and within the site of Jack James, they would have their sheltered space that would be still comprising Louise Dean School. The name of the school would continue. Um, and then, as we have said, all the programmatic and supporting aspects of the school would remain. So uh, really appreciate flagging the importance of culture and identity. And that is a really important component that has made Louise Dean successful for so many years. And we would certainly want to see that continue. Trustee Vukadinovich. I read stakeholder comments regarding Indigenous education, which mentioned that one of the reasons that Jack James High School was reportedly chosen is because of the excellent work that it does to support Indigenous students, families, and ways of knowing. Um, a key component of this is that Jack James High School has had a staff member dedicated to this process for the past five years. Um, but I'm not clear um, how long that uh, contract is intended to continue. So. Um, what can you tell me about, uh, about future plans for students um, uh, and their families to get a level of care around Indigenous support and Indigenous ways of knowing? Through the chair, uh, what I can share with you is that Jack James High School administration staff are highly invested in leading and advancing the work related to the Indigenous Education Holistic Lifelong Learning Framework. And so what they have invested in over the past few years is really developing that capacity within all of the staff at Jack James. And so while they do have a strategist attached to the school who does provide support, um, the staff is growing and uh, certainly is experiencing great success themselves in uh, being able to support Indigenous ways of doing, knowing, being, and belonging, as well as supporting Indigenous students that are at Jack James School as students currently. 
So although we can't confirm um, what supports will look like into the future as far as the strategist position, uh, what we can tell you is that the, um, the intent of having the, the programming of the strategist more holistically across the CBE was to build that capacity. And so at Jack James as a discrete site that has had a strategist, they have taken up that and have been able to build that capacity in a very authentic way, both to support the, uh, the Indigenous education for all of their students and staff, as well as specifically for Indigenous students. So that certainly would continue onward uh, and, and would certainly be able to support Louise Dean staff as well. But I think one of the other components that's really important is, again, sort of just uh, having a, a larger site with more Indigenous students present if the Louise Dean students were to come into the site where the Jack James students are currently. It might afford them the opportunity to capitalize on centralized supports. So if they are bringing out, say, a specialist from the Indigenous education team or um, a DALSA who provides support with culture and work with, the, with uh, creating bridges between school and parent, um, they would be able to support all of the students that are in need of that support, which means that because you just have a larger critical mass of students, uh, Louise Dean students would be afforded probably more support through the centralized services should that be necessary. So again, really trying to build that capacity, but also allowing for any opportunity to um, capitalize on the two sites together to provide more support centrally. Trustee Vukadinovich. Uh, last, my last question for the day, why did the CBE decide against co-locating Louise Dean Centre with alternative programs such as HERA, the CTE space, or the Education Centre, or uh, an elementary school in the area if it were to be um, available in the next few years? Through the chair, and I will go back to those primary drivers that ultimately had us land at Jack James. And for those different sites that you enumerated, um, there would be challenges. Like, for example, if it was the education center, well, would the partners be able to get that critical mass to be able to continue providing the on-site supports to those students uh, that they've been benefiting from. Um, if it was uh, another location, uh, for example, Dr. Oakley School, would they have access to those career and technology um, uh, career courses and other educational programming opportunities at the high school level um, that a location like Jack James could, could offer? Um, placement, travel time, and, and ease of access. Uh, a school like Jack James very well located and again served by multiple different city bus lines uh, helping reduce some of those barriers to to uh, accessing an education and so those are the elements that ultimately as we were considering different locations had us really land at Jack James uh, and, and start investing a lot of, of time and effort and a lot of your time and effort as well as a result. Trustee May go ahead. I guess that'll speak to my last question, which is around public transit that we know is provided through um, the city of Calgary, Calgary Transit. Um, were there any barriers identified with our consultations or engagements with students and staff around transit access? Um, can you speak to any, any assurances or conversations that perhaps um, can be communicated um, to address those barriers with either uh, transit or within our school system? Through the chair, um, maybe I'll, I'll start by talking about the existing location um, and how uh, public transportation, uh, I guess, created the same sort of challenge that you would have anywhere else within the city initially. Um, it, it's a question of reaching out to our partner, Calgary Transit, speaking with them, making them aware of what the issues are. Ultimately, um, the you know Calgary Transit, the city is constantly reviewing and reevaluating the types of buses, the frequency of buses, the nature of the service to different areas of the city. Um, we obviously can't direct the city to provide a certain level or or have a, conf a confirmation that the level that currently exists will continue into the future because naturally they must adjust according to um, the circumstances. But having said that, 
this same, these same kind of discussions happened for the Kensington site many years ago. Um, the Calgary transit system uh, largely is accessible for uh, strollers and, 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 and young parents uh, with, with young children. Um, this discussion would continue. We have a program here that allows for students to have that flexibility in their start and end times that also allows them to deconflict with those times that might not work for them personally, including those high um, point hours where the, the buses might be particularly full. And again, the ability to spread that traffic through multiple uh, buses as opposed to being uh, on the one single route going into that uh, school. Again, helping reduce the, the congestion, helping enhance the, the accessibility. So um, those discussions, should this uh, proposal be approved, would commence with uh, Calgary Transit um, as we would be getting closer and closer to the, uh, to the uh, relocation of the school. And again, Calgary Transit would be then evaluating uh, their, their service levels and making adjustments uh, in accordance with their criteria and their, their service levels, but based on um, the information that we'll have provided to them. Trustee Close. Chair Hack, I'm wondering if you could indulge a point of information uh, just related to this question. Um, as a result of reading um, Actually, at that time, it was Catholic Family Services, Early Parenthood, and Infant Mental Health Services at Louise Dean Center, which was in our package. Uh, transportation has been raised as a challenge. Uh, and just to, to follow up on what Superintendent Breton has been saying is, not only is it a systemic challenge as far as the routes within our city, but it's also been identified as a barrier, whether the location is Louise Dean Center or whether at a new uh, location. It's been raised by many st stakeholders. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments on the report? Seeing none, is there a trustee who wishes to bring forward a motion regarding this report? Trustee Close, go ahead. Sorry, yes, I do have one. Um, and I'll, I guess I read it now. Um, that pursuant to section N10J of the board meeting procedures, which are ours, the board of trustees authorizes that no trustee shall speak more than twice for five minutes on each motion related to the Louise Dean School closure for purpose of relocation compliance report. Do trustees have any questions about the motion? The motion is that pursuant to section N. 10J of the board meeting procedures, the board of trustees authorizes that no trustee shall speak more than twice for five minutes on each motion related to the Louise Dean school closure for purpose of relocation uh, compliance report. Trustee Close, would you please open debate? Uh, just briefly, and just to, to uh, we, we're aware that our uh, current board meeting procedures are uh, based on three minutes. Um, but because of the nature of the de today's debate, we would like to consider uh, moving it to five minutes, just extending our time. Trustees wishing to enter for round one of debate? Just seeking clarity for 10 minutes total. Oh, just five minutes for each round, I believe is the answer. Point of order, yeah, thank you. Trustees for round one, Trustee Bolger. I'm certainly in support of that motion. I think it's a significant issue we're discussing and I'm in favor of that. Thank you, Trustee Close.
trustees for a second round of debate. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. I only hope that an additional five minutes is enough. I'll just. Any other trustees for round two of debate? Trustee Close, do you wish to close? Now I can actually say something. I think we all hope that we can do it within five. It is going to be difficult, but uh, I do encourage uh, trustees to support the extension of the, the minutes that we're allowing ourselves. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion? Trustee Downey? In favor. Okay, that is carried unanimously. The board will now consider the approval of the minutes for the November 1st, 2022 public input meeting. I would request a trustee bring forward a motion regarding the approval of these minutes. Trustee May? That the minutes of the public input meeting for Louise Dean School held on November 1st, 2022, attachment one to this report are approved by the Board of Trustees. Do trustees have any questions about the motion? The motion on the floor is that the minutes of the public input meeting for Louise Dean School held on November 1st, 2022, attachment one to this report are approved by the Board of Trustees. I'll call the question, those in favor of the motion. Trustee Downey? In favor. Thank you so much, that is carried unanimously. Trustee Bolger, would you please provide the board with a synopsis of the public written submissions received by the trustees in relation to the consideration of closure of Louise Dean School for the purposes of relocation? Thank you. Written submissions regarding the consideration of closure for the purpose of relocation of Louise Dean School were received after the public meeting from September 27, 2022 to November 22, 2022. Written submissions were also received at the Area 4 office from September to November 22nd, 2022. In addition to the written submissions, a two and a quarter hour virtual public input session was held on November 1st, 2022, with attendance varying between approximately 67 to 85 people throughout the course of the evening. This included about 20 CBE staff. Written submissions received by trustees included approximately 310 emails, letters, and voicemails regarding the consideration of closure for the purpose of relocation of Louise Dean School. Of these, approximately 50 were from people who had personal experiences with the Louise Dean Center, including current and former students, parents, and volunteers. 253 were from citizens at large, five had connections to Jack James School, and six were from groups or entities. The submissions received ranged from lengthy, thoughtfully written letters to single sentence emails. Some were plain respectful and others were not. We received a submission from a group calling themselves Save Louise Dean, which included 11 student testimonials, 154 statements from individuals, and a list of over 4,500 names and locations from approximately 318 towns and cities within seven different countries, including Mexico, USA, India, New Zealand, Scotland, and England. No statement supporting as to what these names were intended to illustrate was included, but we can assume it was to save Louise Dean. I would note for the public's benefit that in accordance with the Education Act and the Board of Trustees Governance Culture Policy 1, board purpose, that the Board of Trustees serve and represent the citizens of Calgary only. Of the input received, three recurring themes were evident. The first theme was that Louise Dean provides a critical service to pregnant and parenting teens in our city. Students and parents expressed their gratitude for the Louise Dean Center and wrote about the tremendous benefits of the program. This included having on-site childcare, parenting classes, financial planning, instruction on planning and preparing meals, career counseling, and resource support, all within an exceptionally caring and supportive environment. They spoke to the compassionate staff, daycare workers, social workers, 
healthcare professionals, and teachers that made Louise Dean an invaluable place for them to be able to successfully complete high school and become better parents. The second theme that respondents wanted was that respondents wanted to keep Louise Dean as a standalone site. People spoke in favor of a central location and the value of the school being in its own building. Suggestions were made as to how this could happen, including fundraising, applying for grants, or using CBE reserve funds. Questioned, people questioned whether or not the Calgary Board of Education had considered other locations, including schools with low utilization rates or leasing elsewhere. The third theme related to concerns about the location of the pro proposed site for relocation. These concerns related to student safety, bullying, and transportation. There were a couple of misconceptions noted in the feedback. Some respondents thought that the Louise Dean Centre was being considered for closure, which it's not. It's being considered for the purpose of relocation, while others thought it was moving to Ernest Manning, which it is not. It is being considered for relocation to Jack James High School. Thank you. Is there a trustee who wishes to bring forward a motion regarding this report? Trustee Close. Um, thank you, Chair Hack. Um, that the Board of Trustees approves the closure of the Louise Dean School effective June 28, 2024 for the purpose of relocation. Do trustees have any questions about the motion? The motion on the floor is that the Board of Trustees approves the closure of the Louise Dean School effective June 28, 2024 for the purpose of relocation. Trustee Close, would you please open debate? Thank you, Chair Hack. Um, this is a tough one for all of us because we all deeply care about student success and student voice, whether we are trustees, administration, school staff, community social service agencies, students, volunteers, or donors. We each know the importance of commitment, compassion, and care for one another. Our decision-making process is based on a school closure process, and it's also based on the belief that all children can learn and deserve to be successful. It's based on our mission related to high school completion, our board priorities of academ academic achievement, equity, and staff and student well-being, and of course our values of students come first, learning is our central purpose, and public education serves the common good. Some of you are going to be personally alarmed, uh, perhaps angry and hurt that I'm actually moving and supporting administration's recommendation. And you might not yet be able to hear my rationale. I haven't come to this decision easily. I have read all of the materials and spent time, a great deal of time, reflecting on what we heard from both administration and from our public. Although difficult, I very much appreciated reading the personal reflections of past and present students. It was a way to bear witness to the struggle and resilience and success. I also appreciated that Kindred interviewed past and present students during their redesign research. The importance of having a program focused on pregnant and parenting teens who are also completing their high school education was reinforced, and I know from reading the materials that CBE's commitment to the success of this program is strong and true. Louise Dean is successful because of our educators and also because of community service organizations, volunteers and donors, and of course because of the students themselves. It's a testament to the importance of relationships. This is also a program that exemplifies life in its fullest definition and it tugs on all of our heartstrings, and so it should. I also knew, know from reading and listening that not only do we need to maintain what is a successful program, we also need find to find ways for it to continue to evolve. We need to ensure that students are supported and connected to the community resources they need to be successful to complete high school and transition to post-secondary or work. Learning is our central purpose, but we can't do it alone. We can design improvements with both privacy and security in mind. We can continue our support of working with community partners so that our vulnerable students can develop the skills to stand on their own, not alone, but connected and in community. Partnerships aren't always easy. We have different mandates, we have different expertise, we have different resources, and when partnerships work, it's like having the best dance partner ever. I think we've all seen a dance couple, whether it's ballroom or swing or free form, where there's magic to the connection, to the steps taken together and apart, to the joy and the focus on the music. And I know we are on the cusp of even further magic with Kindred. 
Even more students will benefit as a result of how this partnership is being strengthened, and I'm positive that even more partnerships will be collaboratively created to support the success of teen parents. The values that rise to the top for me include trust, collective action, connection, and systemic change. We need to trust the experts, both educators and community service organizations, and we need to build our programs based on science and evidence so that we can continue to build connections and belonging. We need to partner, take collective action, focus on collaboration and work together and reconnect vulnerable teens to community. I've appreciated the questions that trustees have asked. When I reread the public input, admin's report, and the Louise Dean student concerns gathered at two meetings, and Kindred's redesigned findings report, I found my questions related to the barriers and challenges answered, thoughtfully and expertly answered. In order to sustain success and evolve the program, we need to have this program within a high school, a small high school. Jack James is the best choice for so many reasons, location, their unique and flexible programming, the culture of their school. I heard the concerns about the necessity of a standalone building and it isn't financially viable or sustainable to have a standalone program. It is financially viable and sustainable and laser focused on high school completion that we provide a sheltered component to the program within a high school environment. We know that we are in this together, that we are here to serve the common good and that means success for each and every student every day throughout our school system. And we have to balance competing priorities in order to be fiscally responsible and maintain the uniqueness and wonderfulness of the Louise Dean School. Trustees for first round of debate. Trustee May, go ahead. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Trustee Bolger for her fantastic job of summarizing the written input received. Um, the process from hearing from those affected is so important. Um, and I think just the sheer volume of responses, shared stories about how the Louise Dean program has changed lives forever is so impactful. Um, and I think part of that is the, is the biggest factor is the success of the program for so many years, for so many people, is the partnership with HS Kindred and the personal connection and commitments to each and every student. Um, I think it's crucial to acknowledge the suitability environment that the current building and program's in. Um, I want to remain confident that all students are in buildings that are up to date and suitable. I think this will be a continued conversation within the CBE um, and an Alberta as a whole as we address um, deferred maintenance. So we're looking at 50% of our buildings are over 50 years old. This will, this is important. Um, our deferred maintenance dollars are also um, front and center quite often in these decisions. Um, I understand this is important in an emotional decision, but not making this move could have our successful partner decrease supports to a base model of support. And so that that really spoke to me. I, I don't think a base model is the intent of the program or what would fill the needs of these amazing young and pregnant moms. Um, I'm really pleased to see the work with administration and Kindred to co-create a program in a new space that can fo focus on the well-being of young parents, including young fathers and our broader educational courses. Um, I'm also really pleased that the relocation comes with a detailed concept and funding request to ensure that wherever possible the, the intention, identity, and purpose of Louise Dean are maintained while still having Jack James function in his own successes. Um, in hearing concerns around a safe environment, I, I do see the dedicated isolated spaces, safety measures, um, and the location is uh, central to the southeast, southeast quadrant. Um, and access to bus lines, although I'm, I am hearing through Trustee Close that perhaps a, a larger uh, transportation issue might be in play. Um, I think what speaks most to me is around um, services and what a community is. So I'm hearing about the neighborhood resources and how the community really is beyond the four walls of a school. I personally live quite close to the area for many years. My own kids had immunization and well checks at the East Calgary Health. We spent lots of time at the library and Bob Han Pool, um, and we found a community of support there. Um, I would also like to point out that in 2022, the licensed preschool at Jack James was a recipient of the Minister's Award of Excellence in Child Development, which is a really big, important deal. 
Um, and so to say the school and the area is unfit for children doesn't really appreciate the students and children at Jack James who currently attend and trust the, the preschool. But I do look forward to continue to look forward to continue debate on this. Trustees for round one. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. I understand the, the two main drivers for moving the CBE's wonderful Louise Dean Center out of its current location. And of the two, the biggest drivers that are health and social services, pri services provider can no longer afford to support their services for a shrinking clientele. And therefore, we're looking for a location where our service provider, Kindred, can serve the needs of additional students. Enrollment at Louise Dean School has been steadily declining for almost a decade in tandem with falling teen pregnancy rates. And without additional clients to serve, Kindred would have to reduce services, which would, among other things, jeopardize their ability to continue to offer and staff the daycare centre at Louise Dean Centre. So I understand and fully support why administration recommends moving our much-loved and successful Louise Dean Centre away from its current location. I also understand a few of the things going for the proposed new Jack James High School location. First, I am convinced the school is safe. Um, that this is for several reasons. First, as trustee for the area, I have had the pleasure of meeting the teenagers at Jack James High School at their graduation and at school council meetings, and they are great kids. Let's remember that these kids are attending Jack James High School and not their designated community high school because they need a unique environment in order to meet their full potential. The kids who attend Jack James High School are some of the kindest, most polite, hardworking, and thoughtful students you will find at the CBE. The second reason I'm convinced the school is safe is because we already have many kids in the area and we take the safety of all of our students very safely, very seriously. In the immediate vicinity of Jack James High School, we have a second high school, Forest Lawn High School, which is a community high school with an excellent band program, an advanced place program, and comprehensive programs to serve a variety of student needs. We have a junior high, a hockey rink, as, as Trustee May mentioned, library. We have thousands of children every day in this area, and we are keeping these children safe every day. The third reason I'm convinced the school is safe is because Jack James High School currently houses an award-winning preschool, again, as mentioned by several people. And along these lines, I also wanted to express that I feel disappointed by how many people wrote in with disparaging comments about the community of Forest Lawn. As the elected school trustee for this area, I find Forest Lawn to be a great neighborhood for many reasons. And again, I'm, I'm echoing what, what Trustee May so eloquently stated. Th this area has unique shops, shops, amazing restaurants, a diverse blend of cultures, and everyone in this area comes together to make Forest Lawn feel like a small town in a big city. The community has ex access to excellent modernized LRT and great proximity to downtown. And many people who live in and love Forest Lawn are getting involved in keeping the community clean and safe. Rather than complaining, there are people out there every day who are volunteering their time and making a positive difference, and that is why Forest Lawn is a wonderful community. I feel confident that the school building and the surrounding area is safe for children and youth. So that's one thing the location is going for it, that, that is, I feel it's safe. The second thing that this location has going for it is that it is geographically closer to the communities where most of the students live. This is not an insignificant challenge for students. Louise Dean students may live in various locations across the city. However, most current students live in the northeast and southeast quadrants and they would have shorter commute times at the proposed new locations and it sounds like also um, more bus routes that, that could transport them there. A third thing that the uh, proposed Jack James High School location has going for it is the potential to make a broader range of educational courses available to our pregnant and parenting teens and more academic support for students with complex needs, especially for Indigenous in, and newcomer students. And also in the comments, I read that some Louise Dean Center students had to do high school upgrading in order to get into post-secondary institutions after graduating from Louise Dean Center. And the proposed new location will make it easier for students bound for post-secondary to complete courses at a higher academic level. And I know post-secondary studies aren't for everyone, and that many Calgarians find success by going to the world of work or completing an apprenticeship after graduating from high school. But the Louise Dean Centre should ideally meet the needs of pregnant and parenting teens with a variety of goals and plans for life after high school. 
And the, uh, the fourth and the biggest thing the proposed Jack James location has going for it is proximity to additional students who could benefit from the wonderful services provided by Kindred. Um, as the letter from Kindred states, what we hope to increase through the proposed move is the number of young people we serve in partnership with CBE at the Louise Dean Centre. In their letter, Kindred is also clear that if our amazing Louise Dean Centre program were to remain in its current location, there is a risk that Kindred would no longer be able to remain as our partner. Um, and um, yeah, so, so those are lo lots of things. Oh, I'm done. Oh, I was Five minutes. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. I know, we're all talking very fast. So first I'd like to acknowledge all of the former and current students, members of the public and staff for their written comments, survey responses and participation in live public engagement. There is a strong affinity for this program and it's little wonder. Louise Dean has been changing lives for years. Shepherding pregnant and parenting adolescents towards high school completion, encouraging them to become their best selves in order to create a good life for themselves and their babies. For years, I have been proud to know that CBE has been filling this gap. I'd also like to acknowledge our valued partnerships, whether that be Kindred, AHS, churches, or members of the community who have walked alongside the young ladies coming to CBE's door through Louise Dean, and to those who have supported in the background. In 2019, we already knew that the current building was not going to be a viable home for these students for much longer. Dr. Norman Bethune was also considered as a potential site. However, it was later determined that it would be too costly to renovate that building to meet the needs of the program. Ultimately, that was fortuitous, because if we would have moved Louise Dean into Norman Bethune, we would still be faced with the challenge that exists today looking for a way to expand the reach of our vital partners so that they can continue to offer the critical on-site supports for these students and their babies. Our partner has been clear to our administration in writing to the board and through the public engagement that they can no longer offer the level of support for these students without expanding the number of students they serve in the same building. And because of their mandate, we were looking for a high school. Other high schools don't have the space, and even though Jack James is a small high school, they do have space now, and they will into the future. Most students um, enrolled in Louise Dean live in or near the community where Jack James is located. By placing this program closer to where students live and where they have better access to public transit, we are reducing their commute time and helping to remove a barrier to their ability to attend school, and attendance has an impact on student success. I look back through my notes from the public engagement session and the word I used to describe statements made by Kindred was brilliant. They were talking about working with young fathers, breaking intergenerational abuse, running co-parenting programs, committing to never placing our young moms at risk. And in their experience, the involvement of these fathers has equipped them to become dads. This work, was not this work has not increased the risk of abuse and has had a positive impact on the reduction of intimate partner violence. I made a list of some of the items identified as important in the communication from those connected to Louise Dean or who care about Louise Dean. On-site childcare, instruction on life skills, critical supports, on-site counseling, sheltered space, high school completion, access to a higher academic classes, low class sizes, higher teacher ratio, individualized programs, mentoring, flexibility to tend to baby, co-parenting programming, financial literacy, protecting the integrity of the school, accessible location, long-term considerations, and forward thinking. So has administration adequately addressed all of these issues identified? I believe that they have. Yet I also fully acknowledge that there is one compromise, a standalone building. I also acknowledge that change can be difficult, yet as evidenced by the report, the information shared at the public engagement session, and even the answers to trustee questions here today, we are doing our best to give these students a place that they will be proud to call home and a place where they can get the services and supports that they need. The $17 million that it would take to refurbish the Kensington building would be about two-thirds of our infrastructure maintenance and renewal and capital maintenance and renewal grants available for the entire system for the 
to 23 school year. So yes, in a system that has deferred maintenance of over $160 million, this is a fiscally sound decision, short term and long term. And although it is financially prudent and responsible, the main driver behind this relocation to Jack James is about maintaining or enhancing student programming, maintaining critical supports, and sustaining this program for the long term. Trustee Bolcher. Thank you. The public input we received overwhelmingly spoke to the tremendous value of Louise Dean to its present and former students and their families. People shared how impactful attending Louise Dean was and how it allowed them to successfully graduate from high school and become better parents. At the November 1st public input meeting, one of the very first things said was that the CBE remains committed to Louise Dean. As trustees, we have heard that the supports provided at Louise Dean School are second to none. One of the most important aspects shared by former graduates was having safe on-site specialized child care for their children aged four weeks to four years of age. This service allows students to focus on their learning without the stress of worrying about their baby's safety. All of these services are provided because of the network of supports offered through our community partners, Kindred, and Alberta Health Services. Of the feedback received, one thing that was identified by many people as being important was having Louise Dean remain as a standalone site. The reality is, is that even if $17 million was invested into the Kensington School site or the program moved to another standalone site for that matter, Louise Dean would not be sustainable. We've heard that the current and future services of Kindred cannot be supported at any standalone site. We see an enrollment that is declining currently with 40 to 45 students and a 36% attendance rate. Many ideas were suggested during the public input proposing repairs be made, fundraising ideas and consideration of other locations, but unfortunately that all misses the point. Kindred's mandate and funding model relies on obtaining grants focused around youth mental health. Without more students to serve, grants are not obtained and services decline. The reasons to support this move are in fact to save the program. The supports provided by Kindred along with AHS in supporting pregnant and parenting teens are indeed critical to the effectiveness of Louise Dean and without them, Louise Dean is not Louise Dean. Fortunately, we've been assured that these supports can be maintained and enhanced with a move to Jack James where Kindred can support more students. Each year, the CB receives instruction maintenance and renewal grants from the province. This year, that amount was $28.8 million. Kensington School requires $17 million in upgrades. That would require 59% of the CBE's annual IMR grant, which is expected to support all CB schools over the course of the year, not just one school. More than half of our 250 schools are over 50 years old and continually require repairs and upgrades. As governors of the entire system, that decision would not be reasonable or prudent, nor would it resolve the issue at hand. Another concern we heard was that the location in Kensington was ideal, when in fact, from the research presented, is actually not the case. Travel time would be reduced, and the majority of students actually live significantly closer to Jack James than the current Louise Dean Centre. During the public engagement, I too found it particularly disheartening to hear people disparage and speak so poorly about certain schools and neighborhoods in our city, and particularly for those stereotypes to be the focus of media attention rather than the substantive issues relating to keeping Louise Dean viable. Having spent time in many Northeast schools, I've always felt welcomed, observed students who are committed to their learning with caring teachers to support them. In taking a quick look at some of the great CB schools in the Forest Lawn area, we see a population of over 3,700 students who attend school there every day. Just as it would be unacceptable to demean and criticize a certain group of people, it is equally unacceptable to categorize an entire community with a single stroke. We can certainly do better. For those who've read the November 2021 Kindred, formerly Catholic Family Services report on parenthood and infant mental health services at Louise Dean Center Redesign, on page 15 of 36, it clearly illustrates with a detailed city map that 64% of clients live in reasonable proximity to Jack James compared to the Kensington site. Remember that without Kindred, there is no Louise Dean. I'll also enter a round one debate here. I take this decision very seriously. And it's our, sorry, 
It's our decision to make according to the Education Act. This is not something that we get to delegate. Administration has followed the process outlined through legislation and our policies. And I have considered Calgary as a whole within our capital planning, administration's plan, the letters from students and concerned Calgarian citizens. Hundreds of letters received, as my colleagues talked about. Heartbreaking, by the way. Somehow the message has gotten out that the Louise Dean Centre is closing. It isn't. But I can't imagine feeling like I'd be losing everything in their shoes with this understanding. And I don't want anyone to have that feeling or understanding. The proposal of trustees agree is to have the physical building of Kensington School to close. The program in all that it offers and provides to these new moms will not close regardless of the decision. CBE is committed to your success and I am so sorry that you felt like at any time we were not. Students in the program have felt they wouldn't have their own separated space and I heard this. This hurts hearing as I believe every student should always feel as if they belong. The program as is has that feeling of belonging and I see that through the written feedback and what we heard on November 1st. Administration's proposed plan isn't just to move students and to integrate them as we've heard. I want to reassure the public that this feeling of home isn't always a location. It's built by the community, this community of other pregnant and parenting moms, teachers and supports through partnerships. This customized experience will still get, exist regardless of location and will just be for the Louise Dean Center students. This makes me lean towards keeping consistency in these vulnerable students' lives. I've also heard concerns about transportation, which I'd like to clarify. Uh, CBE has identified where the students are from and have been from over the past few years and the location proposed would make for a reduced ride time in the vast majority of students, transit or otherwise. I see that. I've considered this one at depth and what this could mean for moms and babies in strollers or in arms. It would mean they would spend less time in the cold of our winters and have the benefit of a later wake up time when sleep is of utmost importance. I remember being a first time mom and sleep deprivation is real. It's used as torture methods. And getting, I remember getting up early, going to doctor's appointments, vaccinations, and it's honestly, any time I had to leave the house, I remember how much work and time was involved in those outings. And I had the privilege of a partner and a vehicle Many of these students do not have these. Students closer to their school and supports is a win-win in my books and is why majority of our students, even within the CBE, choose their local community schools. I've been hearing from my colleagues on both sides and we've heard from public on both sides and this isn't an easy decision. I want to thank my colleagues for sticking to the issue at hand and putting their heart and soul into this decision. Thank you. Trustees for round two of debate, we're going to go to uh, Trustee Downey. Uh, Chair Hack, are you um, in second round of debate at this time? We are, yes. And you can go ahead. Just for a moment. The Louise Dean Centre is currently situated in a standalone location, a setting that we have heard through the public input process works well for our students. Calgarians are the owners of the Calgary Board of Education. And I believe it's very important to listen to what they've told us. 
based on my own lived experience as a resource teacher working with at-risk youth, I believe that pregnant and parenting teens are served best on a standalone location or offsite location, similarly to outreach students. We have heard a high level of concern around attending school in the same locations as peers in the public input process. I share these concerns with our stakeholders because I understand firsthand the challenges that many students face to even get themselves inside the school doors. High school students are free to come and go as their schedules allow. They are on school grounds and accessing community amenities throughout the school day. This makes the complete separation of Louise Dean students from other students very difficult. Underfunding public school boards has serious consequences. And this recommendation is a prime example. In order to be financially responsible and to work within the resources that are given to us, tough decisions must be made. Although I do not agree with this recommendation, I understand fully why it is before the board today. <clears throat> the total value of the CBE school property portfolio is $5.3 billion. In order to maintain our school buildings, we would like to invest between 1% and 2% of our total portfolio, which would be about $53 to $106 million in maintenance each year. The CBE receives less than 0.5% of our portfolio value, about $35 million each year for maintenance. Many stakeholders have asked why Kensington School um, is not at the level of maintenance we would like it to be, and that's why. In order to bring Kensington, Kensington School back to the level that is ideal, significant investment must be made. If this motion is approved, the CBE would like to dispose of this property and sell the land, the financial gain going back into the system. But as we have seen with other disposed or surplus properties, the CBE is unable to realize monetary gain because the ministry may choose to use the school for a charter school. The CBE is made to maintain these schools and we subsidize the maintenance of charter schools from our own budget to the two of $400,000 each year. I cannot support this motion because I do not believe it is the best way to serve our students. I am speaking with my vote and what I'm saying is that I want resources invested in Louise Dean students to serve them in the way they have told us they would like to learn, which is not among their peers, even with significant accommodations. Given the state of Kensington School, I agree that the Louise Dean Center needs to move, but I do not think this recommendation points to the right solution. I ask my colleagues to stand together to allow for a different resolution, as well as to advocate for commitment from our government to fully fund this important school in the way that works best for our students. Trustees for a second round. Trustee May, go ahead. Uh, so I can appreciate the points made by other trustees, um, also through the student engagement, public input, and the written public comment. Um, I can also acknowledge the hurt by many who may want Louise Dean to remain as an isolated independent site. I, I understand that. Um, but I do believe that this program can have long-term sustainability, continue to meet the unique needs for these young and pregnant moms at Jack James. I see thoughtful, dedicated, isolated spaces, long-term goals, wraparound services, flexibility, and a location that can be a new home and carry on the incredible work for all students and their families. Having a proposed transition plan with a year and a half time frame will allow for individualized plans that can early on address any concerns and prepare for this possible change uh, if it were to occur in September 2024. Um, that being said, I will now identify some process pieces um, and trustee responsibilities that do influence my decision. So um, all the information required under a GC 3E closure of schools has been met and personally, in some cases, I think exceeded 
with our partners and administration demonstrating the understanding of the sensitivity of what this closure for the purpose of relocation means to the very special program we offer within the CBE. Um, I think it's also prudent that as trustees we ensure effective stewardship of the board's resources under section 33 of the Education Act as well as deliver appropriate education programming to meet the needs of all students enrolled. I'm confident that the closure for the purpose of relocation is reasonable and in the best interest of these students and the CBE as a whole. Trustees for second round. Trustee Dennis, go ahead. I found the comments criticizing the neighborhood or the safety of Jack James to be very disheartening. We are a large school system that welcomes over 131,000 students to our schools each day, plus thousands of staff members. So to put that in perspective, if CBE were a city, we'd be the third largest city in the province. Not all incidents that occur in and around our schools are reported by the media. Every one of us around this table would be disingenuous if we didn't admit that challenging circumstances occur from time to time in communities across the city. Life happens in and around our schools. And many, many students come to school with vulnerabilities, not always pregnancy, but vulnerabilities that are unique to those students and that require care and respect. If we are saying that Jack James isn't safe for these precious students, then in turn we are saying schools in certain communities aren't safe for any of our students. And I don't believe we would say that because it simply isn't true. All of our schools are safe. In correspondence, we were challenged to consider whether or not we would send our own daughters to Louise Dean at Jack James. And my answer is yes. Although I do believe that these students would be better served in the Jack James location, it is not the location that makes this program special. It's the wraparound supports and the community built around these students. And if it were my daughter or someone else I loved, I would want them to have every opportunity to succeed and to access the expanded programming available at Jack James to ensure that they would be in the very best position in difficult circumstances to build a life for themselves and their baby. And maybe it's because I grew up in the neighborhood and even today I live only 15 minutes from my childhood home. The community is safe, welcoming, full of hardworking, proud Calgarians. And I have no doubt that they will welcome these new members to their community. To create this bridge will be the responsibility of CBE, and I have every confidence in our desire, ability, and commitment to make that happen. By supporting this recommendation, I can answer yes to the following questions. Am I upholding my oath? And am I true to my fiduciary duty? Yes. Is the board's direction and our voice through policy fully reflected? Yes. As a starting point, I see alignment with OE2, OE3, OE5, OE9, and R4. Is this a reasonable recommendation that aligns with our values and offers sustainability of the program? Yes. Based on the entire body of evidence, by voting against this recommendation, I would be complicit in the slow death of this valued program, or at the very least, a reduction in services that will make Louise Dean unrecognizable. And I can't live with that. In cons consultation with our valued partner, Kindred, our administration has presented this opportunity to maintain the most beneficial and cherished components of Louise Dean. When you hear the students talking about how Louise Dean became home, it wasn't about the building or the location of the building. In fact, it was about the support and care they received at Louise Dean. 
the service providers and educators surrounding these students and the community they built within is what made it home. Many comments from former students and members of the public were, keep Louise Dean open. I believe that this recommendation does just that. And I'm grateful for the commitment of the CBE and our partners who not only want the same thing, but who have worked hard to find a way. Trustee Bolger, go ahead. The public input we heard highlighted concerns about integrating Louise Dean's students into a regular mainstream high school, which after hearing all we've heard seems inaccurate for a couple of reasons. First, Jack James is a small, unique high school setting with approximately 425 students, which is significantly smaller than any other CBE high school. It offers dual credit, off-campus work experience, PLP, and k and &E programming. Secondly, Louise Dean students are not being integrated into Jack James. They will be offered sheltered programming, have their own entrance, and dedicated learning spaces that are entirely their own. Jack James staff also expressed that there wasn't space in the school despite the noted utilization rate. Unfortunately, this can be said at many of our CBE schools, where there's space, it's often valued and used very effectively. Every decision or indecision has consequences. The consequences of Louise Dean may include a modernized school with community wraparound supports, as well as increased support for Indigenous and English language learners who represent a significant portion of Kindred's clients. Another consequence could be a continued scaling back of partner supports, significant ongoing maintenance issues, or the eventual loss of the program. As governors of the system, we must consider all 131,000 of our students. This year, we welcome close to 6,000 new students with increasingly complex needs. We have over 700 Ukrainian refugees and more than 30,000 English language learners. Again, every decision or indecision has consequences. The ramifications of not making difficult decisions when they are recommended to us by administration, who are in the best place to do so and are fulfilling their responsibilities, help the board in being effective stewards of our resources, providing educational programming for all students and providing long-term sustainability of programs. Choosing not to make difficult decisions will result in larger class sizes, less funding for each of our 250 schools, fewer supports for students, additional stress on staff, and a lack of financial resources to upkeep our significant infrastructure needs. The 2020 Grant Thornton CBE Ministerial Review commented on the board's financial cost management and governance. It stated, in hindsight, it would appear that difficult decisions could have been made earlier in order to reduce the significant risk associated with depleted operational reserves. The bar report submitted in May of 2019 continued to highlight areas where investments were being made in various programmings, programs above and beyond what were being funded, all to kindergarten, ELL, and transportation. In addition, in one situation, an opportunity to both save costs and potentially improve educational outcomes was presented to the board by management for approval, given that it related to a potential school closure. In April of 2019, the board decided to vote down management's recommendation that the school be closed. As trustees, our decisions require us to weigh various aspects, including legislative obligations in the Education Act, public input, operational expectations, board reports, and financial and educational impacts to the CBE. Our administration has brought forward and recommended to trustees its best thinking in order to keep Louise Dean viable. They know that if a move is not made where Kindred is able to support more students, thereby enabling them to access the grants that support their programming, they will be unable to provide the services required for Louise Dean's students. Our fiduciary duty as trustees is to act in the best interests of the CBE in its entirety. By relocating Louise Dean to Jack D James, we are making a difficult choice but ensuring that the program will be able to continue. I am satisfied that administration has explored all of its options and deemed Jack James to be the most suitable site to relocate. We have heard it is close to where most students reside. We have heard that it will offer everything currently provided at Louise Dean and more. Most importantly, the site will allow us to continue our critical partnerships with Kindred and AHS. Without them, Louise Dean is not Louise Dean. Trustee 
Trustee Bukadinovich. Thank you, Chair Hack. I appreciate CB administration because we have some of the best and brightest people in education working for, for us here. I can see that the work that went into this recommendation, um, I can see why Jack James High School was selected. Um, and I, I appreciate that staff at the CBE made this recommendation to trustees not because they want to put an end to our incredible Louise Steven Center, but rather because they want to protect its future. But I am still struggling with how to vote on this matter. I'm struggling um, whether there truly is enough space at Jack James High School because um, of the way the provincial government calculates um, utilization rates. They're, they do not reflect um, uh, that are how well used our schools are at the CBE and I'm struggling because while I understand the, the benefits of Jack James I, I feel like I there's I've received little information about why other locations were not selected along the way um, but as I deliberate I'm keeping in mind what Kindred wrote to the CBE Board of Trustees um, on October 21st of this year and members of the public can find this letter on page 117 of, uh, of 172 of the public agenda package, Kindred wrote that um, the Calgary Board of Education and Kindred have a long history of working collaboratively and creatively together to provide best-in-class services to young parents. The multi-generational impacts of Louise Dean Centre over the last five decades cannot be overstated. However, before us is a window of opportunity to co-author the next chapter that includes the very best of who we have been and can be for a new generation of teen parents. We firmly believe that if we act swiftly now, an even better, more sustainable Louise Dean Center is in reach. I find those words from Kindred quite compelling. And, and as I continue to mull in the next few minutes which way we'll vote on this decision. I, I think about their words and whether this, is an indeed, whether this is indeed an opportunity for a new, exciting, even better chapter or if we're missing out an opportunity for an even better new location. And as I continue to think about how I will vote here in the next few minutes, I would like to share an additional thought. Many Calgarians have engaged in the stakeholder consultations. And I hope many of these stakeholders are taking time today to tune in and follow these deliberations. However we vote today, I hope, in that in this, I hope that in this season of giving, that these hundreds of stakeholders consider making a donation through Education Matters to support the current needs and future scholarship needs of Louise Dean Center's current students and future graduates. Wherever this program ends up housed after today's vote, I encourage Calgarians to donate diapers, food, baby clothes, and money to support these parenting teenagers and their babies. You can go online to Education Matters to donate scholarships for Louise Dean Centre moms and go online to Kindred to donate to diapers and essentials for Louise Dean Centre moms as well. Let's surround our pregnant and parenting teens with a community of love. In conclusion, our commitment to serving young parents remains so strong. In weighing my decision, my, my, my vote, my own personal commitment to serving young parents remains strong. And I'll enter for a second round. Today is not about pitting one, one student group against another, but our reality is that we have to use money effectively. Calgary continues to grow CBE continues to grow at massive rates this year, might I add, and our budget doesn't. It's unfortunate, but our reality is how can we serve all students throughout the system with the funds that we have? At $17 million in repairs to serve less than 50 students is where I get stuck. Even in 2018, 2019, when the CBE first started looking at the relocation, there were 70 to 165 mothers. The program has continued to decrease, looking at uh, the data of not only who attends, but the rates in which teenage pregnancy takes place. The Louise Dean students are already supported at a higher rate than our average student due to higher need. And a lot of my colleagues have pointed that out and, and the continuing care and wraparound services. This also includes from CBE, our operating budget and extra supports, Kindred and AHS, all very much needed, no disagreement there. 
I believe administration along with AHS and Kendra have no intention to remove anything they currently get as was asked by the questions today and answered. And the decision I am making is based on the fact that the Louise Dean must remain a stable supported program within CBE. We cannot lose these supports or this program. I would suggest my colleagues support this motion as a building change only. The physical change is one of those things in life that is so hard for so many and come with massive emotion. It will affect the current group of students and I know administration will work with individuals to support them in this move. The insides of classrooms may look different and the students may travel on a different bus, albeit a shorter trip in most cases, but the program will remain, supports will remain or increase for the Louise Dean Centre students as well as for the Jack James students. The community that students and staff have built is strong. A move is a massive disruption and one that I hope does not have to affect future students. This decision has been putting students at unease since 2019. Let's make a decision today to move it. And I would warn, caution and men on any future moves that affects these students. They need a stable environment when their whole world is changing, becoming a mother. Thank you. Jesse, close, do you wish to close? I've been sitting here listening to um, my amazing colleagues and I've been moved and um, to tears, to smiles, to gratitude. Um, I think we bring a skill set, and we can talk about this later, but I just so appreciate the different focus and the different lenses that everybody has brought to the same decision. Um, the only thing I want to add is um, there's a profound importance to being collaborative, to participating in collective action, and it requires being brave, but not necessarily perfect. And for some of you today, you're thinking it's not yet perfect, but we have to act. And we can continue, in order to continue to make a difference in the lives of individual students, their families, and all of our communities. So is this going to be easy? No, absolutely not. Um, but it's important student-focused work that we can collectively do together with partners in order to make the transition to Jack James successful. Thank you to each of you, and regardless of how you vote. I've really, truly appreciated um, today's conversations and the focused laser attention on strategic use of resources and our mission and values. With that, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion? Trustee Downey? Uh, I'm opposed to the motion. Okay. Trustees in favor are Trustee May, Trustee Close, Trustee Bolger, Trustee Dennis, Trustee Bukadinovich, and Trustee Hack. Those opposed are Trustee Downey. That is carried. That brings us to the consent agenda of our meeting. There were no items pulled from consent. As such, all items will be deemed to be approved with the agenda. The board has one legal, one land, two labor, and two strategic planning matters to deal with in camera following the public portion of this meeting. That brings us to the conclusion of this portion of the agenda. I'd like to thank all of you who joined us for this meeting. Our next public board meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, December 13th, 2022.